Tonight we're debating whether or not humans were specially created less than 10,000 years ago, and we're starting right now. With the creation side, Dr. Mark and Mr. Colby, thanks for being with us. The floor is all yours for your opening statements. My name is Hugh Owen. I'm the director of the Colby Center for the Study of Creation, which provides a forum for Catholic theologians, philosophers, and natural scientists all over the world who defend the traditional teaching of the church on creation. So how do we know that God created man less than 10,000 years ago? We know because he told us so. Dr. Kevin Mark and I are directing all that we say in love to those of you in the audience who are seeking the truth. So let me begin by giving you a logical proof that God, the all-powerful creator of all things, exists and must exist. If you don't understand this argument, don't worry. I'll introduce you to God in another way that will be much more direct and personal after this introduction. Number one, there must be something that exists by necessity. Otherwise, nothing would exist given enough time if the universe is infinite in time and at the beginning of time if the universe was created. Because if nothing is the agent, then nothing is the result. Number two, granted that something exists by necessity, it must be more powerful than everything else combined since those things cannot destroy it. It must also be powerful enough to be the first cause of all the other things. That which is the first cause of all other things has demonstrated the maximum power possible to demonstrate. And since it exists by necessity, it also has power greater than anything possible in the future. Therefore, its power is infinite. Number three, a thing which knows all is more powerful than one which does not. Therefore, this being is all-knowing. Number four, goodness is what is desired. But what is desired by anything is its perfection. And so goodness in anything is its perfection. And any contingent thing, a thing that is not the cause of its own existence, has some range of possible goodness it is capable of. But the necessarily existing being of infinite power has the greatest possible goodness. So God is infinitely good, which means infinitely desirable. Now, all living things testify to the existence of the supreme being, to his all-knowing intellect, and to his all-powerful divine will. All living things contain coded information that tells little molecular machines in their cells how to assemble the building blocks of their bodies. The simplest code requires an intellect and a free will. The coded information of living things is far more complex than anything that human beings have invented. A 2DB hard drive can hold almost 2 trillion bytes of information. One pinhead of the DNA in the nucleus of the simplest one-celled organism can hold as much information as 2 million 2TB hard drives. To convert the simplest living organism into a human being would require the addition of huge amounts of functional genetic information to the genomes of the original ancestor and to the intermediate organisms in the lineage. The spontaneous addition of new functional biological information that would endow an organism with an organ or function that was not coded for in the parent's genome has never been observed. Thus, evolution is a hypothesis without a viable mechanism, whereas manifestations of God's supernatural creative power have been witnessed by innumerable witnesses since the beginning of time. 750 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Hebrew scriptures predicted the coming of a God-man. He was to be of the lineage of Abraham, of the house of David, and was to be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. He was to visit the temple in Jerusalem. He was to give sight to the blind, raise the dead, and heal every kind of illness and infirmity. He was to be scourged and crucified in Jerusalem for the sins of mankind and finally rise from the dead. The true God, Jesus, the true God-man, was able to bring life from non-life. He had showed that he had complete dominion over all of nature. Jesus taught that the Jewish Old Testament scripture cannot be broken, and the genealogies in that scripture reveal that man was created less than 10,000 years ago. Our Lord then gave St. Peter and the apostles and their successors divine teaching authority. And from the time of the apostles, the Catholic Church has taught that man was created less than 10,000 years ago. Moreover, to confirm his perfect reliability, our Lord Jesus Christ left incontrovertible proof that he himself died and rose from the dead, and that he has the power to give eternal life to those who believe in him and obey his teaching. The sacred body of our Lord Jesus Christ was wrapped in a linen shroud after his crucifixion and death. At the moment of his resurrection, he left a miraculous impression of his body on the shroud, which has been treasured by his disciples down to the present. 
history records only one person who was scourged, crucified, had a lance wound in his side and a crown of thorns. The blood on the shrub is post-mortem blood. NASA developed an instrument which is called the VP8 image analyzer to map the surface of the moon. It can distinguish minute differences between light intensities. Pictures have shapes and colors and do not contain this light intensity information. But a photographic negative of the shroud shows a consistent 3D relief of a human body. No other photo on Earth will produce this effect. On a sample of the Turin shroud, scientists applied a new method for dating ancient linen threads by inspecting their structural degradation by means of wide angle X-ray scattering. The experimental results support the hypothesis that the Turin shroud is a 2000 year old relic as held by Christian tradition. In the 1980s, a study was to examine the limestone strontium dust found in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, believed to be the burial tomb of Christ. This same limestone strontium dust was found on the Holy Shroud. This is compelling evidence that the shroud was once in the Holy Sepulchre. The study was conducted by a team of researchers from the National Agency for New Technologies, Energy and Sustainable Economic Development in Italy. It was led by Dr. De Lazaro. The study of the shroud concluded that it would take 34,000 billion watts of VUV radiation to make the image on the shroud. This output of electro electromagnetic energy remains beyond human technology. The only logical explanation for this image is that it was produced by the God-man when he re-entered his body and rose from the dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. There are 153 church Eucharistic miracles in which our Lord Jesus Christ has proven that he brings life from non-life by his divine power in the Holy Eucharist. On August 15, 1996, in a parish in Buenos Aires, a parishioner received a consecrated host in his hands and dropped it on the floor. The parish priest, following the instructions of the church, put the host in a container filled with water and left it in the tabernacle so that the host would dissolve. On August 26th, the tabernacle was reopened to remove the fallen host from the container. And it was found that the host had not dissolved and had some reddish stain. Famous forensic histopathologist, Dr. Robert Lawrence, examined the host. He concluded that the portion of the host that he examined corresponded to the tissue of an inflamed heart, which meant that the person to whom it belonged must have been in great pain. Later, to remove any doubt, the sample was given to the leading expert in cardiac pathology and forensic medicine, Professor Frederick Zugibe. The professor didn't know that the sample was from a consecrated host. After studying it, he said, the sample you brought me is a heart muscle, more precisely the left ventricle. Dr. Zugibe then asked Dr. Lawrence whose sample it was. When he told him that it was from a consecrated host, he said, doctor, when you brought me that sample, that heart was alive. You see, God has done everything he could to show you not only the reality of his existence and his reliability, but the infinite depth of his love for you. You can be sure that our first parents, Adam and Eve, were created at the beginning of creation less than 10,000 years ago. Dr. Kevin will now show you that sound natural science supports that statement. But by far the best reason to believe it is because God said so, as recorded in his inspired word, the Holy Bible, as it has been understood in his holy Catholic Church from the beginning. May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever. Amen. Okay, um, I'm Dr. Kevin Mark, a board member with the Colby Center for the Study of Creation. And I'm convinced man was created less than 10,000 years ago by a special act of God. The predictions of evolutionary theory have been spectacularly wrong. I'm going to start by talking about junk DNA and specifically this because genetics is proving creation and denying evolution. In 1972, the term junk DNA coined by, was coined by an evolutionist. Evolutionists argued that the genome must be almost entirely non-functional junk because if most of the genome were actually functional, the rate of harmful mutations would be much too high, which would lead to ge genetic degeneration or de-evolution. It was said that our genome is littered with junk and that this was consistent with the evolution of the human genome apart from any type of intelligent design. A junk-filled genome was used to argue against God as the author of the genome. There is no author of life needed to create a junky genome. 
In 2012, a multi-million dollar international study determined how much of the genome was active. The 400 plus ENCODE scientists, whose depraved research on aborted babies we utterly condemn, discovered that most of the human genome, even the so-called junk DNA that is not translated into protein, is actually used, is actively transcribed into RNA. It turns out that the different parts of a gene can be used for building many different proteins. So any gene is composed of multi-purpose building blocks. The ENCODE results have completely changed the way we view the genome. Instead of it being just a protein generating engine, the genome can now be seen as an RNA computer doing multiple calculations primarily within the so-called junk regions of the genome. Within any given stretch of human DNA, there are multiple overlapping codes, meaning that a change to any specific letter might affect multiple different genetic messages. Darwinian evolution simply cannot account for the origin or preservation of these overlapping codes. Mainstream science has falsified the myth that almost all of the genome is junk. In 2012, the Science Magazine article headlined, ENCODE Project Writes Eulogy for Junk DNA. A senior scientist with ENCODE affirms this, noting, almost every nucleotide is associated with a function of some sort or another. The parts of our genome that were thought to be junk DNA are actually essential for life. Darwinists have still not come to grips with this yet. The refusal to accept what the data plainly shows is not because they have a sound scientific basis to do so. It is because of their unyielding ideological commitment to Darwin. They are well aware that the collapse of the junk DNA story is a death blow to Darwinian theory. One evolutionist scientist, Dan Grauer, has gone on record saying, if the human genome is indeed devoid of junk DNA as implied by the ENCODE project, then a long undirected evolutionary process cannot explain the human genome. If ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. In addition to modern genetics proving evolutionists were wrong in their view of junk DNA, genetic researchers have now determined that there are on average about 60 new mutations per generation in humans. Virtually all are harmful. Dr. John Sanford, geneticist, said, Condra Shav, an evolutionist who is an expert on the subject, has advised me that virtually all the human geneticists he knows agree that man is degenerating genetically. That paper indicates human fitness is declining at 3 to 5% per generation. We at least agree that fitness is going down, not up. There is really no debate on current human genetic degeneration. These 60 mutations per generation are passed on to the next generation as the next generation continuously accumulates more mutations. Thus, the entire population is affected with each generation becoming more mutant than the last. This is degeneration at the population level. This is evolution going the wrong way, devolution. Natural selection can slow down but cannot stop genetic entropy on the population level because most of these mutations are nearly neutral. That is, they are not severe enough to be selected for, yet like errors building up in a computer code, their presence will eventually result in an error catastrophe or an extinction event due to a population's inability to thrive. At that point, nothing can be done. There is no way to reset the genome. This is James Crow, an evolutionist and population geneticist. I do regard mutation accumulation as a problem. It is something like the population bomb, but it is a much longer fuse. There is less reason for optimism, but the ability to deal with much more numerous mutations with very mild effects. But this is a problem with a long time scale. The characteristic time is some 50 to 100 generations. Well, mutation accumulation is not only a problem going forward 50 to 100 generations from now, it is a major conceptual problem for evolution's supposed past, since evolutionists claim the first humans came onto the scene some 200,000 years ago, which is about 10,000 generations ago. The mutation accumulation we empirically observe simply does not fit with evolution theory, which predicts our genome should be improving with time, not deteriorating. But mutation accumulation fits perfectly well with the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, which tells us that Adam and Eve were created perfectly by the hand of God, that only about 160 to 200 generations have passed since then. Mitochondrial Eve is genetic evidence of a literal Eve, the mother of us all. All geneticists agree that there is but one mother of us all. Mitochondrial DNA sequences have been analyzed and a very close approximation of Eve's mitochondrial DNA sequence has been reconstructed. The average human being has diverged from the original Eve sequence by only about 38 to 40 mutations. The mutation rate within human mitochondrial DNA has been measured to be between 0.119 and 0.197 mutations per generation. This fits within the biblical time scale through some simple math. Evolution would need at least 2,500 generations, while the above 
fits perfectly well with the creation model. Only about 193 to 336 generations needed for that mutation rate in the mitochondrial DNA. The fact that there is a singular mother of us all, mitochondrial Eve, that is common to all humans, correlates perfectly well with Holy Scripture and tradition, which tells us that all people can trace their ancestry to a single woman, Eve. Evolutionary theory did not predict this. If modern man's ancestors first came out of Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago and diver diverged into Homo erectus populations in Africa, Europe, Asia, and Australia, then over this much time, accumulated mutations would cause each continent to have its own distinctive mitochondrial sequence. So a real woman who lived less than 10,000 years ago is the mother of all humanity. We know her mtDNA sequence. Within each one of us is a slight, slightly mutated version of her original sequence. Y chromosome atom is genetic evidence of a literal atom, the father of us all. All gen geneticists now agree that there is only one paternal ancestor for all people on Earth. An evolutionist originally coined this term Y chromosome atom. The original Y chromosome atom sequence has now been constructed. The Y chromosomes of most modern men are less than 400 mutations removed from Y chromosome atom. The observed mutation rate of the Y chromosome, however, it turns out is about three mutations per generation. If evolution was true based on the observed numbers, we would expect to see some 30,000 mutational differences between modern man and Y chromosome atom, 75 times more than what is actually seen. While the biblical time frame fits perfectly with known mutation rates and observed divergence from the atom sequence. Thus, a real man who lived less than 10,000 years ago is the father of all humanity. We know his Y chromosome sequence. Within each male alive today, there's a slightly mutated version of this original DNA sequence. This final slide is a comparison of a fitness decline simulation using a realistic human mutation rate following this concept of genetic entropy, and it's compared with the patriarchal lifespans of those of Noah's descendants right after the flood, and you can see that the lifespans decreased in correlation with the relative fitness decline according to genetic entropy. Therefore, this gives credence to the long lifespans in Genesis. And that's my, uh, my close. You got it. Thank you very much for that opening statement. And we are going to kick it over to the Atheist team. So want to say thank you so much for being with us tonight. And want to also welcome you. If it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. And we hope you feel welcome, whether you be Christian, atheist, Muslim, you name it. We are glad that you are here. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button as we have many more juicy debates coming up. For example, at the bottom right of your screen, David Wood and Nadir debate on whether or not there's scientific evidence for Muhammad being the one true prophet this Saturday. You don't want to miss it. Hit that subscribe button. With that, thanks so much, Tom and Mark. The floor is all yours. Uh, who wants to go first, Tom? Do you want to go first? No, you can take it. All right. Um, I just got to share my screen briefly. Uh, just give you one second. Uh, one, two. Okay. All right. Greetings, my name is Mark Reid and I'm joining Tom Jump here. Thanks to Modern Day Debate for giving us this opportunity and thanks to my opponents for joining us and presenting um, an opposite side and something to uh, debate against. Today we're debating were humans specially created 10,000 years ago and I'll be with Tom, of course, taking the negative. Um, in truth, um, we have an easier time. We basically... Um, do not have to uh, believe in special, all we have to do is, is show there's no good evidence for special creation over any other hypothesis out there for the origin of um, humankind. Um, it's up to our opponents to demonstrate the, uh, this claim, some positive evidence towards this claim, instead of just attacking an alternative hypothesis. Um, so I, I'm just going to run through, I've got a very quick presentation, I just want to run through a couple of my biggest problems with special creation, just what I have problems and why I cannot possibly believe that special creation is true. And, and these are just sort of a few points. 
um, that I'm going to outline. Um, the first one is that the design arguments, that it was a special creation that was designed, they've got problems with the design. And I'm just going to point out a couple of examples of that. Um, there's fossils that we have dated more than 10,000 years. This just throws the 10,000 year thing completely out the window. And we have artwork and artefacts older than 10,000 years. Um, and these have all been um, dated by experts. Um, they're not in contention. The, you know, the only people that contends with them are people with a bias towards their own beliefs. And um, as, as you probably do know or you, you might know, science is supposed to eliminate bias, not lead towards it. Um, so the first one is the problems with design, and this is one of my, my favourites. Um, it's the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And basically, um, and I'll just get a pointer here so you can see that the, the nerves of everything like, they're basically the same, although in different configurations. You've got this nerve, which has basically been brought further and further down. And I, I wish I could find a better picture. I do apologise. I had to throw this together uh, quite quickly. Um, but basically, as, as the heart travels down here, um, the, they, the aort comes further and further lower, but this, this nerve is still wrapped under it, basically. And so the design, or the design, I should say, um, the, the, the anatomy eventually ends up with a nerve connecting from here to here, going all the way down throughout the body, wrapping around the aorta and, um, or the, the second aorta, and then coming all the way back up to the top. Now, this is the worst design you will ever see in your life. There is no, no reason for this. It causes massive problems. Um, there, there's, there's no, absolutely no reason why it should be the case. Yet it is so. This is, this is the way the anatomy is structured. So, so to connect a, a sort of, you know, a couple of inches, it goes for this massive detour. Now, it gets even worse. And I do realise we're not doing evolution today, so I'll just breeze past this. But this is it in a giraffe. It's essentially the same. The black is the nerve. It goes all the way down the giraffe's neck, wraps under the aorta and back up the top. It is one of the stupidest designs you will ever see anywhere on the face of the planet. Um, the second one that I've got, so... Um, the, the problem here is that the creationists, that they would have to claim that it was designed to, to be badly designed, and that's my problem with it. Um, if, if it was designed from a top-down method, it would, it would, if it was basically designed to look like it occurred naturally, like from a bottom-up sort of a process rather than top-down, um, this is a really weird thing, but it does suggest it was developed over time, not through some act of special creation. Um, wisdom teeth is another one of my favourites. Um, from an evolutionary standpoint, and I realise we're not doing evolution, we're doing special creation, basically as we our, we got went into soft foods and we had less roughage stuff, our third molar or the wisdom teeth basically became useless but they're still there. And in a large amount of cases, these impact and, and actually threaten our lives. They, they're actually something that breaks and kills us in a large majority of cases. If you do not have them extracted and they impact, um, it, it definitely would result in death if they become infected. Now, this is the worst design you could ever put. Something that has no function that you put into your design that breaks and destroys the thing you've designed. It is the stupidest design you'll ever see on the face of the planet. Now, the fossil record. This is Lucy. Meet Lucy. Now, Lucy is um, Australopithecus afarensis. Um, she was found, I believe, 3.2 uh, uh, million years old. Um, and, and uh, you know, you might say, hey, that's not a complete skeleton. Well, there is one. There's a little foot uh, dated at 3.6 billion years, and that's we consider to be a complete skeleton. Um, and that's um, Australopithecus prometheus, I believe, slightly older, older one. But the, the thing is that there's been hundreds of fossils found, and all of them seem to reach the same conclusion. And, and the, the dating methods used, I mean, they are, they do have, you know, 
error margins to them, 1%, 5% error margins. But when you're looking at millions of years, the error margins do not approach anywhere near 10,000 years. I mean, you're looking at uh, uh, 3.2 million years with an error margin of 1%. Um, in some way, you have to go through and debunk every single one of these fossils, and there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, so in order to demonstrate special creation, you would have to debunk all of these. Now, artwork. This is from Blombos Cave, South Africa. I realise this isn't a very good picture, but we do know the okra used here is at least 73,000 years old. Um, it has been tested by experts. It is that age. Um, again, there is Borneo, 40,000 years old. Um, <laughs> um, you, you have uh, in Germany, 35,000 years old. Uh, this is a, a called the Lion Man statue. It's an anthropomorphic figure with an animal head. We're not even sure if this is some kind of religious figure. It may be, it may not be, but it certainly is not younger than 10,000 years, not in the slightest. Um, and lastly, from my own home country, Australia. This is 17,000 years old, minimum, and they think it may be anywhere up to 40,000 um, depending on the artwork that is around there. Um, th this is absolutely ridiculous that, that people do think that the world is less than 10,000 years old with, with every single thing that, that we've got there. Um, so I'm going to see if there's any reliable, robust evidence for their special creation rather than against any other hypothesis that uh, has come up. And I'll certainly enjoy talking to uh, Dr. Mark and uh, Mr. Owen about uh, their, their evidence here. Um, that's about all I've got. Um, so I, I do thank you for your time. Sorry, and I'll stop sharing the screen when I can. <clears throat> My apologies. Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to T-Jump. That's okay. I can do it on my side. All right. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the topic today is were humans specially created less than 10,000 years ago? The answer is no. And all of the evidence indicates this. Um, in order to test if one theory is better than another theory, all you have to do is look at what the theory can predict that we will discover in the future. Which one of the models, the creationist model or the scientific evolutionist model, has been able to predict future things before we have discovered them? As far as I know, creationism has never, ever predicted anything successfully ever in the history of ever. Uh, as far as I know, science is the only thing that does that. Science accurately predicted the evolution of ants and where we would find the fossils transitioning from different kinds of ants and bees and hornets. Uh, evolution or Creationism didn't predict that. Um, evolution correctly predicted that certain kinds of double jointed jaws that were found in mammals at this particular layer and location they would find them before we actually discovered them. It's a pretty good prediction. Evolution predicted that Tiktaalik, a transitional fossil between a fish and a lizard, would be found at exactly the particular strata it was found in before it was found. Evolution predicted that DNA patterns and um, endogenous retroviruses patterns would exist in particular species that we already predicted were related, and that was correct. All of the predictions of evolution have been confirmed. All of the predictions of creationism, well, they just there just aren't any. So any model and is able to accurately predict the future and tell us what we're going to discover before we discover it is rational to believe that it tells us or corresponds to reality. If a model cannot do that, if it cannot ever tell us something about the future we haven't discovered yet, then it's not reasonable to believe it's true. It's just most likely made up. That's the fundamental difference between creationism and evolution. Evolution can predict things in the future. Creationism just complains that science is predicting things and finds Things that are hard to believe, and that's it. No predictions, no progress, nothing that we can use, nothing that makes any kind of difference to any academic field whatsoever. It's just explaining away past data that science is done with. But the ones making the progress, those are the scientists, They're the ones that evolution are indicating in every possible realm of every academic field. Um, a few other lines of evidence. Obviously, all of the evidence is that the world was created 13.8 billion years ago. If the world was created... 10,000 years ago in some respect, that would mean that God must have created photons already in transit 
from stars that never existed. So like we have light in the sky that came to us from billions of years ago, from billions of light years away. Uh, but if we were only created 10,000 years ago, then God must have created those light uh, photons at about the stage of like Jupiter or something and didn't even bother creating the stars that they came from. It just looks like they came from stars, completely implausible. Uh, there's many other implausibilities of the stories of creationism, why it completely fails. But really the main reason is no predictions. If you have no predictive power, if you can tell us nothing about the future, your theory is debunked. And I will conclude there. With that, we're going to jump into rebuttals, and this is 10 minutes from each team. Also want to let you know, folks, if you haven't yet, click that share button below, as you probably have a friend who enjoys debates like these, and you can click that share button below this video to share this link with them so they can enjoy it as well. With that, we're going to jump into the first rebuttal section, and thanks so much, Dr. Mark and Mr. Colby. The floor is all yours. And hey, Hugh, do you want to go first, or should I? I am happy to go first. On my top of my screen is blocking me from going to PowerPoint. Um, I mean, to the PowerPoint slideshow. Just one second. Okay, I moved it over. We're all set. Well, how do we know that God created man less than 10,000 years ago? He told us so. If the naturalism assumes that the effect can be greater than the cause, that natural processes could produce nature, something from nothing, life from non-life, and naturalism also assumes that geophysical clocks all tell the same tale of long ages, but that is false. Now, naturalists assume if I have a piece of granite that contains a certain amount of potassium and a certain amount of argon, and I know that potassium consistently decays into argon at a constant rate, I can calculate that it would take 1.2 billion years for the amount of argon in my rock to be produced by potassium to argon decay. Therefore, my rock must be 1.2 billion years old. Now imagine that I examined the same piece of rock using a second hourglass. This one has radium in the top section, decaying into radon gas to the lower section with a half-life of only 1,600 years. Now, granite contains several pairs of parent-daughter elements, so geology textbooks tell us that if we apply this dating process using multiple pairs of decaying isotopes, we should get the same age from both. Yet each year, people in the Sierra Nevada die of this deadly radon gas, which owing to its very short half-life shouldn't even be detectable if the granite continental bedrock was even close to the evolutionary age we are taught today and that our opponents believe in. The naturalist atheists have no reliable way to determine the age of mankind or of the earth because they have no way of determining which of the many geophysical clocks are telling the right time. They have no independent, reliable judge to whom they can appeal, but Christians do. God is outside of time and he created mankind, so he knows the exact age of mankind and has revealed it to, through his word. Those who embrace a naturalistic worldview like our opponents also blind themselves to the greatest part of reality, which is the spiritual world, both the good spiritual world of God, angels, and saints, and the world of evil spirits who try to turn us away from God in his revelation, especially in regard to creation. 1908, 1908 Madame Marie Bure diagnosed the suffering from blindness from bilateral optic atrophy due to severe injury to her brain. On the 5th of August in 1908, after attending Holy Mass at the Grotto at Lourdes, France, suddenly her sight returned. Examined by an oculist the same day, it had to be admitted that although she still showed signs of retinal pallor of cerebral origin, she could read the smallest print in a newspaper. In other words, she could see even though she did not have the physical hardware necessary for sight, which proves that she was seeing with her soul and not with her brain. Now, our Lord showed that he had to work two miracles with every cure of blindness. First, he had to fix the hardware, the physical basis for sight. Secondly, he had to infuse into the person's nervous system the knowledge of how to use that hardware to see. Who wouldn't trust the word of such a divine wonder work? It's also extremely naive to close one's eyes to the reality of evil. Anyone who undertakes a serious study of exorcism, will find overwhelming evidence of the reality of demons and their ability to turn human beings away from God and his word 
about how he created the world. In the 17th century, Rene Descartes rejected God's Genesis revelation in favor of our opponent's naturalistic uniformitarianism, the idea that everything came into existence through the same material processes that are going on now. But Descartes only embraced this false philosophy after he had stopped practicing his Catholic faith, led a very immoral life, and dabbled in the occult, after which he recorded that he had three mystical dreams in which the spirit of truth possessed him and put him on a path to develop a new way of thinking that would change the way people thought. Descartes was not actually possessed, but his account of this experience contains many telltale signs of demonic influence. One of the most famous exorcisms in history took place shortly before Descartes' birth in France, before at least 10,000 witnesses. A woman named Nicola Aubrey became possessed by a large number of evil spirits after visiting a fortune teller. The local bishop took over the exorcism, which lasted several months. He offered the holy sacrifice of the mass and then prayed the prayers of exorcism over Nicola, who lay on a platform in the church. During the exorcisms, witnesses watched as 15 strong men who were needed to restrain Nicola when the demons attempted to do violence through her, were lifted six feet in the air by the demons as they held onto the platform bearing Nicola's body. Eventually, the prayers of the bishop and the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament drove the demons out of Nicola once and for all. Now, it would be extremely naive to deny the reality of evil spirit or that they use their brilliant intellects to deceive people into rejecting God and his word in Genesis. My beloved friends in the audience, in the name of Jesus, don't let them do that to you. Mark. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. So um, I want to start, start by uh, talking about wisdom teeth that Mark brought up. Um, I'm a dentist and I often get the question, why do we have wisdom teeth? Well, the answer is very simple. Wisdom teeth are just as good as any other teeth, and we are designed to have them. Most people in the world have their wisdom teeth, and they've come in just fine. The people that don't have their wisdom teeth come in properly are people with soft Western diets, like most Caucasians. And the answer as to why that happens is because it's nothing to do with evolution. It's Because when we are uh, eating these soft diets and not chewing coarse food, we tend to develop smaller jaws because our musculature isn't growing as much and therefore we're causing problems for ourselves. I mean, this is the same reason we get crooked, crowded teeth um, and cavities for that that matter are poor diets. Um, Native Africans and Australian Aborigines who uh, have coarse diets their wisdom teeth come in perfectly and they don't have problems of this type. Uh, Breastfeeding is also something that unfortunately doesn't happen very much in our society. And this is one reason why people's jaws don't develop well enough and also um, cause wisdom teeth problems. Do people have problems with wisdom teeth? Yes, definitely. I take out wisdom teeth all the time. I also take out other type of teeth all the time. But again, this is a problem that we have caused for ourselves based on their di- our diets, not anything to do with evolution. But even if it was something w- that you would want to call evolution, um, it wouldn't prove evolution, it would just prove devolution. It would be a, a decrease or in, in uh, useful information in terms of people getting worse over time, not better. And this goes for the uh, any type of vestigial organ argument, um, this idea that um, we have vestigial organs that are useless. um, That's the reason why um, tonsils used to be taken out all the time, even prophylactically. And only later was it um, found out why that was so wrong, um, that people are having more diseases um, in, in the respiratory systems as a result of taking tonsils out. That was driven by evolutionary ideas that tonsils were vestigial organs. Um, And let's uh, just talk a little bit about um, paleoanthropology. So um, this idea that we have somehow um, proven 
that we've evolved from ape-like creatures is false. I mean, look at these quotes from evolutionists. The once popular fresco showing a single file of marching hominids becoming ever more vertical, tall, and hairless now appears to be a fiction from um, the uh, International Chair in Paleoanthropology um, in Paris, France. Uh, and, and you can just read quote after quote from um, evolutionist uh, paleoanthropologists showing that um, this idea of us transitioning from this ape-like creature into humans um, isn't um, something that is even considered a fact anymore. Um, and then I want to just talk a little bit about um, that the idea that um, starlight somehow proves the age of anything. Uh, well, in the Big Bang Theory, the laws of physics are broken all the time. Um, and it seems to be fine for scientists who hold to this paradigm to basically invent whatever they want to fix up the theory, um, and including some scientists who say that uh, the speed of light at one time may have been trillions of times faster than it is now. And if the speed of light was during creation instantaneously fast, all of a sudden we don't have any distant starlight problem. And for that matter, the one way speed of light has never been measured. So it cannot even be shown um, what the one way speed of light is as if this somehow um, proves the age of the universe. Um, the final thing I wanna say is that um, this idea that um, all we're doing is attacking evolution and not providing our own model is false because my entire presentation was based towards showing that the genome is almost fully functional, that the um, mutation rate in mitochondria and Y chromosomes um, support creation, and um, that genetic entropy, um, if you go back in time, supports this idea of a perfect original uh, human pair in the beginning as well. So all of these are positive arguments towards creation and not merely just taking shots at uh, evolution. All right, I'll, I'll rest my case here. You got it. Thank you very much. We're going to kick it over to the atheist side for their rebuttal as well. And T-Jump and Mark, thanks so much. The floor is all yours. Uh, do you want me to go first, T-Jump? Yeah, we can go in the same order every time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, first, uh, Mr. Owen, God told us so basically, he's basically assumed the uh, the the conclusion up front like so many creationists do they basically have a book that they like they assume the conclusion then find the evidence to try and make it fit this is not unusual in the slightest for creationists um something exists by necessity why can't the universe be uh, not contingent he didn't explain why that is um he just assumed that it couldn't be the case do not know why goodness is desired is it by who for what why he's already assuming that god is the conclusion and that god wants goodness in some way and therefore bakes it into his uh premises of the conclusion um all, all things are a testament to the supreme being well this is the look at the trees argument basically that hey uh, if we assume that everything was created by god then everything is evidence of god um it's it's a really terrible argument because you've already assumed that everything is the creation of god up front um uh, code requires intellect and free will. Um, you're conflating sort of biological, you know, DNA code with computer code. Um, it's done a lot. Um, in fact, I believe you mentioned computers at one point. It might have been um, it might have been Dr. Mark that did though. Um, so most of this was God of the Gaps, um, arguments from incredulity. Um, they basically have a, a book to support this. Um, um, in fact, in fact, uh, uh, Hugh Owen said that the best evidence is the Bible. And I think that rings true. The best evidence is a, you know, thousands year old book written by primitive peoples with no understanding of science. I would actually agree with him on that one point. That is his best evidence. Um, 
the the Shroud of Turin. Now, the Shroud of Turin is an interesting one to bring up because it's sort of just ridiculous in the idea that it's an actual artifact. Um, the Shroud of Turin is a two-dimensional image, which is weird because it's supposedly laying on a three-dimensional body. You'll notice there's no top of the head um, for the Shroud of Turin, no top, where if the shroud passed over the head, you would see it laid out and have a three-dimensional representation in two dimensions. But the Shroud of Turin doesn't have this. It's so quite obviously a forgery and, you know, locked away in Catholic vaults, so they can't, um, you, you can't have a look at it or, or, or um, you know, evaluate it anyway. Um, so most of this is anecdotal evidence, claims, you know, miracles. Um, um, if Jesus did exist and he was buried in some tomb that you found, it makes no difference to the supernatural claims. Jesus could have been a real person. He could have been buried somewhere. It is not evidence for any of the supernatural claims you're attributing to him. So that's just poor evidence right there. Um, now on to um, Dr. Mark. Um, junk DNA, de-evolution, no evolutionary paper makes mention of de-evolution. It just does not come up. Um, harmful mutations are much too high and this, this whole idea of junk DNA being impossible. There are a number of hypotheses as to why that would not happen, which you've obviously clearly admitted. Uh, omitted, I, I do, I beg your pardon. Um, but we don't know the answer to that one. It's a God of the gaps. Just because we don't know the answer doesn't mean you get to insert God as the answer or, for the purposes of this debate, special creation as the answer. They're, they're like punctuated equilibrium, like um, a, a uh, downturn in the amount of males in the populate. There, there's a number of suggested um, um, things that could result in this, but you've ignored all of them and inserted God. You've got no reason to. It's just an unlikely explanation. Um, where's the paper for God? Where's the paper concluding that God is the reason for this? I notice you didn't point to any of those. You have no paper for it. No paper says that God is the reason why um, um, junk DNA hasn't built up to a, to a certain level. Um it, again, uh, yeah, I was too your pardon. It was Dr. Mark that conflated computers with with bioorganics. It, it just it, it's it's a bad conflation. Computers computers use a, a fetch, execute, store cycle. There's a number of vast differences. Computers don't replicate. Um, there, there are ma massive differences. In order for us to understand it, we sort of say, "Hey, the human body's like a computer." We don't mean that literally. The, the, a computer is way different. It's just a conflation that is just ridiculous. Um, change to any specific letter of DNA may um, affect some part, but it may do nothing. Uh, you know, I love that there's, this is sprinkled with words like may and might and perhaps, yeah, but it might do nothing at all, um, sort of, you know, which computer code, that, <laughs> that certainly doesn't happen, let me tell you. Um, your, your sort of colouring of, of evolutionary Scientists is refusing to accept things. This this whole thing of a conspiracy. For some reason, they would sort of invalidate their own work by by not chasing down the truth. I think is ridiculous. Uh, I think that but uh, evolutionary biologists, like most scientists, follow where the evidence leads. Unfortunately, you've got a presupposition that your book is true, and you're following to your conclusion that you want. Unlike what scientists do. Um, um, you know, and, and I love how it says virtually all mutations are harmful and some are not. Uh, I, I noticed that you sort of swung by that virtually all, but some aren't and some are very beneficial. Um, uh, uh, so human fitness over the years. So, so evolution provides an, an excellent reason why the humans are more affected by disease nowadays. It's because if you interrupt natural selection processes with, say, I don't know, medicine, like, for instance, if uh, asthmatic people would usually die out, and due to modern medicine, they don't. They, they continue to procreate. You have an excellent reason as to why there's more asthmatic people around. The fact that disease is accumulating does not go against evolutionary theory at all. Um, you know, it, it really doesn't. The, the other reasons, yeah, I've already been through that. Um, now, it's interesting that you said the Catholic perspective was the one that you pay attention to, Dr. Mark. I find that odd because the Pope himself said um, that evolution is true, Big Bang Theory is true, and that God is no wizard. And I quote um, Pope Francis verbatim for that one. Um, so it, it's very strange that a Catholic would basically say, well, the Pope is wrong. 
Um, you know, you have to explain that one to me. I don't know how you got there. Um, uh, the, the simple math is, is not correct. Um, this, this very simple equation you've got for the accumulation and mutation, nobody has ever calculated it like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and a lot of this is just cherry picking. Now, I do notice you, one of your graphs, it did not come from a paper and it was, was very, very strange. Um, it was genetic entropy and the mystery of the genome. Although it kind of looked like you were quoting from a scientific paper, you were not. That is a paperback. It is just a book and anyone can write a book. And it's by Dr. John Stanford and put up on, you know, as sort of a um, defeater to the genome. So I think that is a little bit deceptive how that is just somebody's book that you've placed to make it look like you've got uh, a scientific paper evidence there. Um, but I'll leave it there. And that's my uh, review of the uh, incoming arguments. Thank you. All right. Uh, so to review, they didn't actually provide any evidence. They provided a hypothesis. Uh, the difference here is that a hypothesis is when you look at data and you try to explain the data. It's post hoc ergo proctor hoc if you try to then take that data and say, ah, because it can explain the data, therefore it's evidence it's true. Um, the whole point here of science is that you start with a hypothesis. That's great. You can do that just fine. Under creation is perfectly fine to come up with a hypothesis that says, I think this hypothesis is true and it explains the data. But then to confirm that hypothesis, you need to go into the future. You need to say, if this hypothesis is true, here's something in the future we can predict we will find if we discover it, that would be then evidence. But they didn't provide any of that second step. They only provided the first step. Here's some evidence or some, here's some data point that we see and we can explain it. Well, that's nice. Literally every hypothesis can explain it. It's called the problem of underdetermination in philosophy. You can say a magical leprechaun farted out the universe five seconds ago and that would explain all of the data we see also. It's not evidence that it actually occurred. For it to be evidence, you need to then take your hypothesis and say, if it explains this data and it's true, here's something we'd expect to see in the future. None of that was presented, and so no evidence for creationism was presented whatsoever. All that was presented was post hoc or proctor hoc. Uh, we can explain the data, therefore our hypothesis. Using the Bible to prove God is like using Lord of the Rings to prove hobbits. So saying that the best evidence is the Bible, well, then the best evidence for hobbits is Lord of the Rings. It's, it's not really great evidence. It's, in fact, not evidence. Uh, they brought up that nothing is an agent. Uh, and if there's no agent, things can't exist. Well, that's just patently false. Quantum mechanics is the best field, the best evidence-supported field of things essentially being created from fields or nothingness. No, no one in physics thinks there's actually a literal philosophical nothing. There's just not a thing in physics. Um, and there's no evidence of non-physical minds. All of the minds that we have evidence for came from brains, which require physical space time and millions of years of evolution. There's no evidence of any kind of mind being able to do anything outside of space time whatsoever. There is evidence that quantum fields can do things outside of space time. That's something that is a real evidential basis. So if we're comparing the two, uh, quantum fields is the superior model there to explain the data. Um, all the data they presented was essentially wrong. The Shroud of Turin is debunked, as mentioned by Mark. Uh, wide x-ray scattering is not a legitimate source to date things. All it does is it measures the sp spraying of different particles and how it reflects x-rays. It doesn't actually measure dates at all. That's why no one uses it. Uh, junk DNA means non-coding, not non-functional. He's just conflating the encode definition of non-functional, which is redefined to a broader definition not used in biology. So it's all just a basic misrepresentation of the data. With that, we'll jump into second rebuttals. This is another 10 minutes. Thanks so much, Dr. Mark and Mr. Colby. The floor is all yours. Go ahead, Hugh. Would you like to go first, Dr. Mark, or, or I'm happy to do it? Uh, you can go first. Friendly reminder, folks, our guests are linked in the description. If you want to check them out, you certainly can to learn more about their views. So, um, as a matter of fact, the argument 
used at the beginning for the existence of God was not refuted by either of our opponents. Um, something that's contingent is does not explain, it's not the cause of its own existence. And if we simply use common sense, we can tell that the universe is not self-existing because it's obvious that it could be different than it is. So people, there are people who've tried to deny the principle of cause and effect, but nobody ever actually doesn't apply that principle in everyday life or they would be locked away in an insane asylum. And so it's, it's simply common sense logic that a contingent universe has to have a first cause that is non-contingent. And that means that that first cause has all the perfections that we associate with God, the Supreme Being. Now, there's so many things to respond to in what you said, but uh, I'm going to uh, respond to the claim that both of you made that the, the Catholic framework or the Catholic understanding of creation doesn't provide any predictions and is basically useless for the natural sciences. Well, in reality, nothing could be farther from the truth. As a matter of fact, the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation gave the most perfect framework for doing scientific and medical research and the replacement of that framework with the naturalistic uniformitarian evolutionary framework I'm going to show you is the greatest disaster that's ever happened to science and medicine. But first, please let me clear up one big misunderstanding on your part. The teachings of the church are not what the Pope says at a press conference. The teachings of the church are those that have been defined authoritatively and that have been handed down from the apostles. And you will not find any authoritative statement in the entire history of the Catholic Church that finds the evolutionary account of the origins of man and the universe in the deposit of faith, faith that was handed down from the apostles. And Catholics not only have the right, they have the duty to dissent from the opinions of popes or bishops in matters of natural science because they don't have any mantle or protection of infallibility when they venture into that realm. So all the authoritative teaching of the church upholds God's revelation that he created everything supernaturally by willing it into existence in the beginning less than 10,000 years ago. You also don't seem to understand that the Catholic church was established by our Lord Jesus Christ before there was a Bible. The Catholic church gave us the Bible. That's why the Bible calls the Catholic Church the pillar and foundation of the truth. So again, you've grossly misrepresented what Catholics actually believe and teach. Now let me go on and show you how the Catholic Church has given you and all scientists and truth seekers the best framework for doing fruitful scientific and, and medical research. Because according to our framework revealed by God, we live in a lawful universe of well-designed creatures marred but not ruined by the effects of original sin, whose function but not their origins can be discovered through rational investigation. Sir William Harvey, who was in England after the Protestant Revolution, worked within this framework, and when he was asked how he discovered the working of the circulatory system in the human body, he says clearly that he did it because he presumed that it was a designed system he formed a hypothesis on that basis. Why would the designer design the system with the valves and the arteries and all the chambers of the heart the way that they are? That's how he developed the hypothesis, which he verified, and that's how he learned how the circulatory system works in the human body. When the Darwinists came along, they overthrew this fruitful framework and replaced it with a framework within which scientists and medical researchers no longer presumed stable form and function throughout the biosphere. Instead, they perversely presume flux and dysfunction. So Darwin argued that some of the best evidence for evolution was that the human body is full of useless organs that are holdovers from an earlier stage of evolution, like the vermiform appendix. At the Scopes trial, 
uh, the, the scientists from the University of Chicago who were deposed by Clarence Darrow, one of them cited a German anatomist who said that there were no less than 180 vestigial structures in the human body. Now, you asked about prediction. Every traditional Catholic in the world who was involved in science and medicine predicted that the evolutionists would be proven wrong about the appendix, about the tonsils, about junk DNA, and about all the rest of their vestigial organs, including the wisdom teeth, as Dr. Mark showed that you were completely wrong in characterizing the uh, wisdom teeth as not a, an example of good design. Because of the acceptance of evolutionary pseudoscience, the appendix was believed to be a useless holdover from evolution for more than 100 years after Darwin. And because of that, the medical community did not investigate to find out what was the real cause of all the problems with appendix that doctors and emergency rooms were seeing. Had scientists and medical researchers remained faithful to the traditional Catholic framework, they would have presumed stable form and function, and they would have looked for the cause of problems with the appendix in lifestyle and dietary issues and not blamed it on the poor design or the evolutionary uh, production of a perfectly fully functional organ. Over to you, Dr. Mark. Okay, so it was said that, um, is, are, can you see my screen right now? Let me know if you can see it. We can now. Yes. I'm just going to shrink it okay. down. Okay. All right. So it was said that uh, I was misrepresenting what evolutionists said about junk DNA before it was discovered. Well, let's just look, go through some quotes here. Much DNA in higher organisms is little better than useless junk. Francis Crick. Richard Dawkins. In 1976, biologists are racking their brains trying to think of what useful tasks is apparently surplus DNA in the genome was doing. But for the point of view of the selfish genes themselves, there was no paradox. The true purpose of DNA is to survive, no more or less. The simplest way to explain the surplus, surplus DNA is to suppose that it is a parasite or best a harmless but use, useless passenger hitching a ride, a ride in the survival machines created by other DNA. Why are these evolutionists saying this? Because their paradigm leads them to faulty ideas about reality. They predicted that as science went along, it would show more and more that the genome was full of useless junk. It is a remarkable fact that the greater part of the genome might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. Biologist Richard Dawkins, um, and this was in 2009, Kenneth Miller, the human genome is littered with pseudogenes, gene fragments, orphan genes, junk DNA, so many pointless DNA sequences, it cannot be attributed to anything that resembles intelligent design. Again, these men were absolutely wrong. The ENCODE project, it makes them look like fools. I mean, this is the most advanced code in the history of the world, the human genome. And this is, if there's anything that evolution should have been able to show and predict, it is this, but they were spectacularly wrong on this point. Um, look at, um, uh, NIH biologist Francis Collins, roughly 45% of the human genome is made up of genetic flotsam and jetsam. In other words, useless things thrown off of ships that are sinking. Uh, Non-coding repetitive sequences, junk DNA comprise the vast bulk of the human genome. This is from 2010, um, an evolutionary biologist. And even the man who coined the term, the earth is strewn with fossil remains of extinct, extinct species. It is a wonder that our genome to, is it a wonder that our genome to is filled with the remains of extinct genes. This is again, the prime example of where the predictions of evolution lead. They lead to faulty ideas. The ideas that were full of junk, not only in DNA, vestigial organs, and now we're finding uses for all of these so-called vestigial organs. Um, predictions of the predictions of evolution haven't 
been right, they've been spectacularly wrong in this, in the mutation rates, as I showed, of uh, Y chromosomes and mitochondrial uh, DNA in the predictions there. Um, they, and overall, of course, they predict um, that our genome should be improving, that it should actually be somehow getting better, more advanced. It should be shown not only in humans, but in other animal species. And this is simply not the case. We do not observe this at all. In fact, now that we know that our, from generation to generation, our genomes are deteriorating 60 mutations at a time, how exactly do you explain this away? When again, most of these uh, mutations are not selectable. They're nearly neutral. That is, they are building up in the genome, taking away precious resources because the um, RNA is having to copy these, um, these bad mutations as well. And it's just carrying them down. Over time, it's building up, building up. And we simply do not see any of these beneficial mutations somehow canceling out um, the bad mutations. This has to be explained. You can't just wave it away uh, with your hand. Again, um, this was can be seen as a prediction of the creationists. We all thought there would be uses found for vestigial organs. We all thought that, that it would science would prove that the genome actually was not um, mostly useless junk. So on the biggest um, prediction possible, creationists were right and evolutionists were wrong. 30 seconds left. Um, in addition, it was said that there was no other predictions made by creationists. Well, Russell Humphreys predicted the magnetic field strengths of Uranus and Neptune based on a young universe. Um, and, um, you know, when we look at um, some of the other predictions, um, that there's no limit to breeding animals. Um, that's basically what Darwin thought. Dog breeding, fruit fly breeding has proved that false. There is only a limited amount of variation that can happen. And anyone with common sense um, can see that. We can't just keep breeding things forever. It, it, they get strung out and the genetics fall apart if you try that more. And therefore artificial selection is just natural selection going at rapid speed and it fails. You got it. Thank you very much. We'll kick it over to the rebuttal from Tom Jump and Mark Reed as well. This is the final rebuttal before we go into open conversation. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, James. Um, now, okay, so I'm gonna gonna address this because, um, yeah, we've got some some problems here. Um, a whole thing about naturalists assume from Mr. Hugh, um, sort of. I, I think you're you're straw manning a bit there, sort of saying naturalists assume this and assume that. No, I'm personally not technically a naturalist. I don't think naturalism is the only explanation that can be posited. I just think that natural explanations happen to be the best because they have the best evidence for them. So when when you're sort of throwing out these, these naturalists assume this and assume that, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, you seem to prod it like sort of radiometric dating not being accurate, but we rely on radiometric dating for finding oil, finding certain deposits of minerals. There's a, there's a sort of industry worldwide that relies on an old earth model for uh, finding all kinds of deposits and all kinds of minerals and stuff. And, and sort of you pointed out one, um, there's, there's multiple types of radiometric dating that they actually work together to validate an H. So there's uranium, thorium, argon, argon, there's radiocarbon, of course. There's, there's multiple different techniques that they use that overlap their time frame so they can be sure that they do have a correct date, dating method. Um, this, this is a bit weird. It's kind of a special pleading almost for God. It's kind of, well, radiometric dating is not accurate, but a book written thousands of years ago by a bunch of goat herders is. I, I, I fail to see how the sort of a book that unknown people have written can be more and I have to explain that one to me and how we can test this book to see its accuracy because it as as T Jump pointed out doesn't seem to make any predictions that we can rely on whatsoever. Um, and a whole bunch of anecdotal evidence. I don't know why we're not we're not sort of um debating miracles here it seems to have gone off topic with the, the debate being about Jesus and miracles and all this kind of stuff. I only see it tangentially 
um, associated with the current debate that we're having for special creation 10,000 years ago. Um, I, I don't see it as very good evidence whatsoever. It just seems to be more claims thrown out. Um, I don't know where we got into demons and spirits and ghouls and ghosts and goblins. Um, I don't think that's very strong evidence for your claim. Um, we used to think that mental illness was possession. We used to think epilepsy was possession. We, we've sort of come a long way since, you know, shaking shaking branches at supposed demons for, you know, invading our bodies and causing us to be sick. I think this is, you know, if you want to go for for a scientific view, I, I think I think you've you've fallen down pretty hard there. Um, um, so. A lot of this appears to be quote mining. And, and I'll point something out that I'm really disappointed in you, Dr. Mark, because you basically are quote mining and you've done it a lot tonight, a, a great deal. And um, genetic entropy, uh, oh, I do apologise, an evolutionary uh, odyssey by Hublin, you pointed out. And let me let me show you what you quoted. The human career describes one of the most spectacular changes uh, I'll read on. The once popular fresco showing a single file marching of hominids becoming ever more vertical, tall, and hairless now appears to be a fiction. That's what you quoted. If you read on, um, appears to be a fiction. Humankind did not simply pass through successive stages, eventually leading to the emergence of anatomically and behaviorally modern humans. For the most of the past four million years, several species of hominoids coexisted, sometimes in limited geographical areas, it goes on to describe exactly why evolution is true. You are quote mining and you have done it a lot. You've basically brought up part of a quote to make it look like these evolutionists don't support evolution, which is absolutely wrong. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there because really all Dr. Mark presented was a whole bunch of quote mines um, um, and I'll, I'll leave it over to T-Jump. Uh, yeah, so none of my points were actually addressed, except he gave one example of a prediction, I guess, of gave predicting the magnetic uh, spheres of Neptune or something. I, I guess, I guess that's an okay prediction. Uh, we can chalk that one up. One prediction for creationism, ten million for evolutionists. You still lose. Uh, but let's just go through some of the things they said. He he brought up all these quotes saying, "I miss." I, told i said he misrepresented what the evolution is like no i said encode misrepresents the definition of functional in biology the reason the encode product says that a large portion of the dna is functional is because they've literally changed the definition of functional if i say the definition of functional is anything with dna well then 100 percent of the dna is functional because it all contains dna Making up my own definition of functional is not evidence that the evolutionists are wrong. All of the quotes he listed are correct. The amount of DNA that is functional is about 8.2%. The rest is junk. Most of the DNA in humans is junk. Encode did not ever even espouse to doubt that. All of the Encode authors agree with that. They changed the definition of function to mean something it doesn't mean anywhere else in biology. And so nothing in Encode in any way criticizes or critiques or disagrees with any of those biologists he quoted a bit none of it they, they all agree that yes given the definition of function they're using those guys are completely 100 percent correct and the authors have agreed to that yes they've changed the definition of function so not encode doesn't in any way indicate anything in terms of creationism um still waiting for more novel predictions i, I like the one with the with the the, I don't know, the magnetic spheres of Jupiter or whatever. That's great. Can you give us some more relevant ones? Like evolution gives us predictions of, of all kinds that are like directly related to the theory, not just, I think it's designed, therefore I'm going to look for stuff that doesn't really help us at all. Um, and saying that evolutionists are wrong isn't a prediction. Like I can predict at some point Einstein will be proven to be wrong about something, therefore the flying spaghetti monster. Is this, is this evidence of the flying spaghetti monster? No, just saying that evolutionists are wrong about something when literally all science is overturned every couple decades isn't really evidence of anything. You need to give us like some kind of prediction of something we will see or discovery we'll make about a thing, a new particle, something in the universe that we don't know yet that your model can tell us about before we discover it, like what all of the other sciences do if you want your hypothesis to be taken seriously. Um, they argued that we haven't seen any kind of uh, evolution that's beneficial, that's false. We know that mosquitoes are now resistant to different kinds of pesticides. Malaria is resistant to different kinds of drugs. Uh, all viruses evolve new kinds of things, require new vaccines. We literally see new functions all the time, everywhere in, in bacteria. The largest, uh, largest resource of 
evolutionary study is done on a specific kind of bacteria that's been going on for over 50 years with tens of thousands of variations. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of, po of positive mutations, which just were literally were not there anywhere in the DNA whatsoever, and they came about and had a positive function. We've literally observed my macro evolution in a lab so we can just observe it and prove it false. Um, quantum fields are not contingent. They're necessary things. So if you want to say that uh, there must be a necessary non-contingent thing, well, a quantum field, there you go. Saying that God can't be different. Yes, he can. It's obvious God can be different. Maybe God did not drown millions of babies in the global flood. There you go. It's obvious God could be different. So if you want to just assert God can't be different, I can just assert quantum fields can't be different. And we're on evil, equal footing. Difference being quantum fields actually have evidence they exist. God does not. So if you want to make all these philosophical arguments which indicate nothing, we can cherry pick different aspects we want and say, my pretend model is the better one because it meets these pretend criteria in philosophy that have no basis in physics and you can claim anything is necessary or anything is contingent and the only evidence to have is you can imagine it differently and guess what i can imagine god differently so he's not necessary um he said that the, the greatest disaster for science was naturalism because of the appendix like no no this model we've been using has given us tons and tons of discoveries that have increased life expectancy by triple, um, increased the quality of life by significant portions. Like, no, this is not not the greatest, the, the worst mistake for all the science that we got the appendix wrong on one thing. Definitely not. Witch hunts, uh, mass murders of religious people by religious people. Those those are those are significantly worse than the appendix. So I don't I don't know what is standard here for assessing the greatest disaster in science and medicine. Like I don't know Norman Borlaug inventing genetically modified wheat seems to be a pretty good invention. I have nothing to do with God. Um, so seems like most of the things they mentioned again just didn't address my point. Like in order to be a successful theory, you need to make predictions about the future about new things we haven't discovered yet. New fossils, new species. Uh, if we die, we go to heaven. That's a good prediction. Uh, new particles. Give us some discovery about the universe. Just looking at past data and saying you can explain it with your pet theory isn't evidence. You need something new. Uh, genetic entropy is complete bunk. It's been debunked multiple times by multiple sources. It's, there's no basis in any type of scientific paper. It's just completely made up by John Sanford. and just nothing that supports it at all. Um, life from non-life is a composition division fallacy. Obviously, life came from non-life. That's what all the evidence indicates, saying that it couldn't just because the word life is required in the word non-life is just a composition division fallacy. Like, well, we can't make a, a wall from a non-wall. Like, yes, you can. Use bricks. Bricks aren't a wall. Non-wall can come from wall. No problem. It's just a little play on words. It's nothing more, nothing like a serious argument. Um, all of the examples of demons, people lifting off the six six feet in the air and the and all the different Eucharist things, like all that was made up. Like no scientific evidence have ever confirmed any of that. If you have real miracles, publish them in a scientific paper. That would be great evidence. Um, making up a bunch of stories that have all been tried to be confirmed and completely false. Don't do so well. Just pray for a gold brick to appear in front of you. If it happens, that'll be some great evidence. Um, saying that the, the little the, the walking man image was wrong like obviously it's a picture made it's not like a scientific paper that says this literal images of black representations of species is literally how it happened it's a representation to convey an idea saying that that's wrong is obvious obviously there's going to be groups of different individual species living together at the same time and it wasn't literally one blackout limitation of one individual species that then morphed into another one Obviously, that's wrong. It's not even controversial. Um, no one thinks that, that that little black thing is a little representation of how actual evolution works. It's just a, something to convey the idea to people in an easier way. Um, he mentioned the speed of light. There isn't the speed of light issue if it moved faster. If the speed of light was faster, that doesn't make star formation faster. It makes it impossible. So speeding up light doesn't solve the problem. The problem here is that if God created the world 10,000 years ago 30 seconds. and light is 8 billion light years away, the star would have to exist first to emit the lights. Otherwise, God must have created a particle to look like a star, but never created the star, which means God is lying to us. We'll conclude there. You got it. We'll jump into open conversation, which is about 20 minutes. Thank you very much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. Reminder, folks, our guests are linked in the description. So if you'd like to hear more about their views, you certainly can by clicking those links below. And that includes at the podcast, as we actually have a podcast for Modern Day Debate as well. And we put our guest links in the description box for each podcast episode, which is on the podcast within 24 hours of the debate being live. Thanks, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. Thank you, James.
Um, actually, T jump talking about um, the composition fallacy, division fallacy. Um, I, I, there's another fallacy I did forget to mention, and that was sort of the genetic fallacy, a sort of set of a framework, religion games, a framework for science and medicine kind of thing. Now, that this is sort of a genetic fallacy where the origin is a certain thing, so you say it has to contain that thing or it has to be a part of that thing. That's a genetic fallacy. It doesn't matter where the origin of science came from. It's still valid by itself. It doesn't isn't beholden to religion or, or, or uh, you know, religious institutions in some way. Um, and it doesn't, just because science is effective, it doesn't make its origin religion. Uh, in fact, I would argue that the Enlightenment had a lot to do with it as well. Um, but that that's the genetic fallacy, basically, that the origin sort of is the, um, the colours the thing itself. Uh, I'd love to hear thoughts on it. How does this work, James? Well, we just discuss well, openly. Just anything you guys would like to discuss, and there's no time oh. section, so there's just open dialogue. Okay, so then um, let me respond to that. Um, one of the, I guess it was Tom said that we only mentioned the appendix as an example of an organ of the human body that those who believed in the traditional doctrine of creation predicted would be shown to be fully functional. But that, that of course, isn't true. Everyone in the audience knows that we mentioned many other features and other organs of the body. But let me give you an example of how uh, a dis big a disaster, um, this evolution-based evolution uniformitarian naturalist approach to natural science and medicine is. This is Dr. Jerry Coyne. I believe he got his PhD at Harvard, but he's at the University of Chicago, and he's definitely one of the leading champions of atheistic evolution in the world. And in a fairly recent book, as you can see, Why Evolution is True, 2009, he argues that embryology is still strong evidence that a one-celled organism turned into a human body through a natural process of evolution. Now, let's look at his evidence. He points out that every human in the mother's womb has a transitory coat of hair. The technical name for it is lanugo. Watch his logic. He says there's no need for a human embryo to have a transitory coat of hair. After all, it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit in the womb. Lanugo can only be explained as a remnant of our primate ancestry. Now, gentlemen, you asked us to give you examples. We could be here all night, and I could give you examples just as good as this one. This is anti-science. I don't care if Jerry Coyne has a genius IQ. With his evolutionary blinders on, he looks at a feature of the human body, and because of his bias in favor of flux and dysfunction, if he doesn't immediately see what the function of this feature is, he's got an evolutionary explanation. It can only be explained as a remnant of our primate ancestry when we were covered with hair, and swinging from the trees. Okay. Well, I don't know if so you let, know this. This is one hundred percent wrong. Okay, well, so let's, so let's just, just. I want to clarify. So, open conversation. So, the way it works is we ask a question and respond to the question. Like nobody brought up Jerry Coin. Uh, Mark asked you a question specifically regarding uh, your genetic fallacy of saying that you have a worldview that is better because certain scientists think that because the world is orderly and designed. They can look for stuff and that doesn't matter because pretty much every worldview says that they all, they don't think things are just inherently random. Any worldview flying spaghetti monster quantum fields, they all think there's an orderly universe. So why do you think simply because people thought God did it, therefore it must be orderly is a good argument. It seems like a genetic fallacy. No, it's, it's not a genetic fallacy. What I'm showing you is that all Christians, all Christians have believed the truth 
what that God revealed that he created human beings, body and soul, with all their organs, and therefore all the organs of the human body are functional, and all the features like the lanugo are functional. And so when we see something like the lanugo, we presume that it has a function, and if we can't figure out what the function is, we don't do what Dr. Jerry Coyne did and what evolutionists have done with a whole host of organs and features and say, oh, it must be a useless holdover from an earlier stage of evolution. We say we're not smart enough yet to understand what's the function of this particular feature or organ. And that's our job as natural scientists and medical researchers to investigate. And if you had allowed me to show the next slide, I would have shown you that, in fact, Dr. Jerry Coyne, of course, was completely wrong. The lanugo keeps the vernix cassiosa, the cheesy varnish that looks like yogurt, on the skin of the little baby in the mother's womb so that the baby is protected from the amniotic fluid. And okay. Any, well, this any is this is a back and forth, not not a presentation. So we you you kind of made your point multiple times over, and we we want to discuss it now. Um, so what I did notice is that you brought forth a quotation from a book. Um, now I just want to you seem to be conflating these things a lot. What's when somebody publish a book versus when they publish a scientific paper? That when that anybody can publish a book with anything in it. In fact, you sort of showed graphs from a book that sort of, um, you know, weren't from a scientific paper. This isn't a paper in science. This is what one person has written in a book. So we've got to differentiate those pretty strongly. Papers are peer-reviewed. Books are not. So if he was publishing a paper and he was wrong, well, great, one scientist is wrong about something. I can show you all the scientists that write about things um, in evolution, but you seem to want to focus on one scientist being wrong. But I'm not just focusing on one scientist. It's, it's easy for anybody to verify for himself or herself that the whole mainstream evolution-believing scientific community was wrong about the appendix, about tonsils, about junk DNA, about lanugo, about embryonic recapitulation, which denigrated the total humanity of the unborn child from conception and led to the greatest holocaust of innocent human life that the world has ever seen. Heckel was the main salesman for Darwin. He was the most effective salesman, and his evidence was totally bogus. But as late as 1959, Sir Julian Huxley, the leading evolutionist scientist in the whole world, said that that was the best evidence that he had that a one-celled organism turned into a human being through a natural process of evolution. You well, are I can, not characterizing our, our argument correctly at all. So, so I can grant there are lots of evolutionists who have been wrong, but they've been more right than any of the creationists. So evolutionists were right about the age of the earth, the age of the universe, the age of all of the planets. Uh, evolution was right about uh, how oil forms, about where we can find oil, about uh, different rock strata, where we'd find things in strata, they would predict things in the future. So yes, you can find hundreds and thousands of examples of scientists who have been wrong but as far as i know pretty much all of the creationists are wrong and have never been right on a few maybe a few cases appendix okay i'll grant that but if you're just comparing like the number of wrongness the number of wrongness in creationism far outweighs the number of wrongness in scientists the fact that a few scientists get things wrong isn't evidence against science it's just guess what people don't ever don't get everything right 100 percent of the time so that's not an argument for your position to say that oh look some science has got things wrong this isn't a positive argument for your position what you, would you're be not be, understanding uh, can i just add something really position. quickly i just want to piggyback and add something really quickly that it, you could say the same for any field of science like for instance medicine they got tons of things wrong look they used leeches look they used all of these terrible techniques you can say that for any field of science that in the past we have got things wrong so you know but, but what i'm hoping that the, the uh, what i'm sure that our friends in the audience are seeing is that our framework that is based on god's revelation is what leads to fruitful scientific and medical research because we didn't adopt this false assumption of constant flux and dysfunction. And that's what leads to the discovery of the proper function of all of these different kinds of organs and features. You, you're, you're not understanding our position correctly. 
Why is it your framework? Can you explain that to me? Why is it your framework all of a sudden? It's it's the framework that follows from what God revealed about how he created the world. He uh, how do you demonstrate that God revealed that? He, he, we can demonstrate it very easily because yeah. it's, first of all, it's, it's in the Bible, which was, which is made up of the books which the Catholic Church in the first centuries of Christianity identified as being the inerrant word of God. Sorry to interrupt, Mark. I wanted to, I really like no, the appendix it. thing. So I really like your example of the appendix. I think it's a great example of why you're wrong, because one of the first scientists to predict the function of the appendix was Charles Darwin himself. He, he was like the first person to predict it had a function, the guy who invented evolution. So if the guy who invented evolution was the first person to theorize a function of the appendix and he didn't believe in a God, that seems to completely review your entire argument because he's an atheist. It doesn't refute our argument at all. Darwin didn't understand the actual function of the appendix. And look, it's it's easy for anybody to research the history and see that the evolution-believing mainstream scientific community for more than 100 years retarded scientific and medical research by holding that the appendix was non-functional. Whereas during that entire time, those who held fast to the, the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation knew that it was functional and that the problems that people were having with the appendix, just as they were having problems with wisdom teeth or with, with tonsils, were because of lifestyle, diet, and other concerns like that. Whereas the evolutionists were not looking to identify the actual root causes of these problems. Well, the thing is that Darwin didn't understand a lot. I mean, Darwin didn't know what DNA was. Darwin didn't understand the process a lot. But he did, as T-Jump said, predict that it did have a use. And I think I've got a sort of, we seem to be having some problems with the word vestigial. And I did notice it earlier that, that when somebody says something's vestigial, it doesn't mean they're saying it has no purpose. They're saying it doesn't have the purpose for what it had in the past. Its purpose has changed. And you seem to be using that word to sort of go, well, they said it was vestigial. The vestigial doesn't mean no purpose. Well, no, the vestigial may not mean no purpose, uh, technically speaking, but that's the way it is certainly used. I mean, if you read, look up arguments. Not scientifically. Like, if you look up arguments from scientists even who are making, trying to make this understandable to the general population, they are very much making the argument that these vestigial organs are useless. So we can wrangle all we want over technicalities, but I mean, if for practical purposes, that in fact is what the evolutionists are arguing. Well, well sometimes it is. One sec, Mark. Sorry, I to yeah. pick up on that. So you're conflating how scientists communicate to the public versus technical scientific language of what is actually used in academia. Taking like what Bill Nye, the science guy, says on a science show as being scientific fact and saying, oh, look, Bill Nye made a mistake and he said something that's not scientifically accurate. That isn't a condemnation or a criticism of the scientific community. That's a criticism of how scientists communicate to the larger public. So what you said is literally just not a criticism of science. It's a criticism of how scientists communicate to the public, which is a separate topic. Well, maybe so, but when you look at even in the scientific literature, um, you do not see what Mark is saying, that as if they're arguing that vestigial organs are useful. I mean, that's absurd to even make that point, in my opinion. Well, I think well, they do. I think they literally say that. They literally, none of them say they do literally nothing. Like, obviously, blood and different kinds of fluids flow through the appendix. It's it's alive. And so it's going to have some binding effect with the DNA in the cells there to, like, burn calories, to use up ATP, to uh, use up fat. Like, obviously, it's doing things in the body. No one in science thinks it literally does literally nothing. And these things, even burning calories, is going to have a positive effect on the health of the human. So, Clearly, no scientist thought this did nothing. That was well, just not a thing. I mean, you look at tonsils, they were taking them out prophylactically. And even um, appendices, that is, in fact, what many doctors did think, that this is, we can chop this out, no problem, and expect no consequences, because they did think it was essentially parasitic on uh, a human. And I've given you an example with Dr. Jerry Coyne, where 
you, everybody in the audience could see that, yes, he says that he believes that the Lanugo had a function when we were covered with hair and swinging from the trees, but he definitely thinks it no longer is functional now, and he's 100% wrong. And his evolutionary so, bias prevented him from being able to do what a good scientist does, which is to determine what the function of that feature is. So I want to cover this because it was actually in as a point of law in America at one point, I believe it was in Kitzbühler versus Dover for irreducible complexity, if you remember that one. Famously, Behe uh, advocated for the creationist side. Now, in that, vestigiality was discussed and it was demonstrated that vestigial organs are not ones with no purpose, but ones whose purpose was changed. And I believe the main example was the uh, flagellum in bacteria, which purpose had changed from a feeding to a, um, a movement um, um, organ. So also, you, you are completely wrong. You are 100% wrong. It's even been litigated successfully. So Also, Jerry Coyne isn't an embryologist. He, he's a fruit fly expert. So I don't know why you're bringing him up as an expert to really know whether or not that would have a function like he's not an expert in that field he well, we're bringing it up because for all practical purposes scientists and medical doctors are using this vestigial argument in order to retard science basically well, they're, could they're, you give an example of an embryologist who actually works in the field of embryology who said this rather than someone who works in a completely different unrelated field who doesn't know anything about the topic certainly that would be great uh, i mean there's absolutely no doubt that in the field of embryology, the overwhelming majority of scientists went along with Heckel's fraud that the human embryo recapitulates all the stages of evolution in the mother's womb. And in 1959, Sir Julian Huxley, a biologist, said that that was the most striking proof that a one-celled organism turned into a human body through a natural process of evolution. And yet Michael Richardson, an embryologist, published the actual photographs of the human embryo and the embryos of the fish, pig, turtle, chicken, and salamander at the same stage of development in 1994 and showed that for more than 100 years, the consensus view was totally wrong in a matter of life and death. Okay. Because how do we and Huxley's acceptance of it and the mainstream acceptance of it denigrated the humanity of the unborn child from the moment of conception. Okay, I've got to address this time frame because you're talking about something from 1959, okay, 19, more, more than half a century ago. I could point out a lot of medical things from 1959, like they did, you know, um, lobotomies on, on mental patients and they did, you know, shock therapy and they did, uh, horrible things because they were medically wrong. I could point that out right now from 1959, and and that does not mean that the field of medicine is now debunked and, and over with and we should ignore everything that it's got to say because they made mistakes or that we're wrong about things in the past. Your reasoning is absolutely terrible. Well, Just no, because it, people got things wrong does well, not mean that the theory of, you know, germ theory should be tossed out the window. Well, that's the thing. It should have been discarded in 1959, but it hasn't been. These lies are still being propagated in the textbooks to this day. We still see, see the same fraudulent images that Heckel invented in textbooks now. So yes. th that's what we're talking about. This evolutionary idea is so embedded in people that they cannot even give up that which has already been proven wrong. Well, I'm not seeing well, the relevance. Been, so, so, well, I'm not seeing the relevance of here how Heckel made pictures which aren't used to make academic decisions at all and are put in some high school textbooks to represent something. And if you switched it out for the actual images, you, no student would be able to tell the difference. Like this is just a representation to give people the idea of what's going on. You don't need a literal actual pictures. This is not like people are actually using this diagram in academic sources to actually make decisions. This is a thing you put in some textbooks for some younger people to convey a simple idea. It's not like this is the foundation of everything. Like this is not a relevant well, picture. It's it like is, a picture. So it's like it a picture is relevant because they're using it to things. propagandize young students. All of the people no, that not. end up scientists How? and doctors are going through this evolutionary propaganda. Why do you think How? they become evolutionists? How? Because again, 
No one is looking at these pictures and saying, oh my God, these pictures are just everything in my entire academic career. If you literally switched out these pictures for the other pictures, there would be literally no difference to anyone That's who's reading the book. That's simply not true. That is totally untrue. How? It makes a world of difference. Yeah. Like what? If you, if you look at the Michael Richardson photographs published in the journal Scientific American in 1994, it's obvious to anyone, I encourage the audience to look them up, that the human embryo is very distinct from the embryos of all the other kinds of creatures at the same stage of development. And what's also obvious is that each kind of organism is also distinct from all the others at the same stage of development. Look, this is completely contradictory to all the predictions of the leading evolutionists from Darwin to T.H. Huxley to Heckel to Julian Huxley, to Carl Sagan, down to Richard Dawkins and the rest of them today. Don't try to make this out as some, some, something that's not consequential or that the mainstream scientific community didn't go along with something that was totally bogus and had life and death consequences. And we can show you 21st century textbooks that are perpetuating the fraud and not giving students the truth. As Tay Jump said, it was pictures in a high school textbook. Uh, let me give you an analogy of what this is like so you can understand why we don't see it to be a big deal. It would be like opening a, um, a astro uh, astronomy textbook and saying, hey, your picture of the solar system is a complete fraud. The sun's only like this far away from the Earth, and the moon's way further than that, and all the other planets are grouped up together when in reality you wouldn't have room to put them in there. That is an analogous to what you are saying. Look, you're, they put it in a textbook and, and drew it to try to make it clear what they were describing, not scientifically but in an education way for people to understand just like they would the solar system. Nobody thinks that the sun's, you know, that distance away from, from Mercury or what have you. Nobody thinks that. It's just that's what we put in textbooks to explain what we know. And, and I think that's a good analogy. No, it's not a good analogy. I can show you Why? a textbook, a 21st century textbook, biology textbook, by, by a, a very prominent scientist here in the U.S. who was a co-author, and he his his illustrations are very hard to tell apart from the 19th century heckle forgeries. And in his caption, he says that all vertebrates start out with gill slit, an enlarged head region, gill slits, and a tail. Now, don't tell me that that's just like the solar system, you know, making things a little bit different than they are in reality so that students can get kind of a rough idea of the relative position of things in the solar system. That is totally different. Are what you are arguing that they gill don't? Slits have nothing to do with respiration. It's I think garbage. he is arguing that. Wait, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not following the error there. So all embryos, vertebrates do have gills and tails. Um, which what was no, the they error? Do not. Absolutely not. What? Humans are vertebrates. We never yes. have gill slits. Yes, we no do. anatomist or embryologist worth his salt. Yeah, um, that notion human embryos have have gill slits. I, no, I don't know. What no, you're they about. do not. We have, have a, all gill slits develop into the pharyngeal arches and different parts of our facial anatomy. They have nothing to do with respiration. Well, and right. that, the gill slit lie to. was propagated by textbooks. That's okay. why you two believe that, because it's, you've been they're, they're duped by propaganda. Right, right, they're not literal The two of gills. you believe in something that is yeah. totally false. No, the we, two have, of we you have actual pictures. Okay. believe pictures. in something that is hold, hold, hold. totally false. We have actual pictures of actual embryos that literally have the slits exactly where gills are. Whether or not they're specifically they're not used in gills. the embryo as gills, clearly they're not. No one is saying that no, embryos yeah. literally have gills. They have a slit exactly where gills are in all of the different vertebrate species we see. Then so, why are you calling them gill slits in humans? Because they're the same exact spot and locations as the animals that do have gills who do develop them. So if That's all no of the embryos, justification. That's totally unscientific. I can provide if a paper not for you if you want. That's completely unscientific. That's anti-science right there. So it's, it's the same as it, when in male and female embryos, the, the same organ develops into like the penis or the clitoris or whatever. And we see one part of the embryo that develops into multiple different things. We can say, oh, look, it's this thing which develops into this other thing. 
The same thing applies here. We can look at the slits and see how it develops in some species and how it develops in other species and say, oh, look, what is the similarity here? What was the cause or the original function of this thing? Ah, it was from the gills and these other things. That makes perfect yeah, sense. It's perfectly assumption. scientific. No, that's a pure no. assumption on your part. You have no proof that the reason we have those features is because we evolved. That's your assumption. No, it makes evidence. much more sense to believe that it's a design feature because they develop into the pharyngeal arches in different parts of our facial anatomy. They never have anything to do with respiration. So why do they just like change into gills in fish then? Listen. Why not design so something different? different? Why not design something different? Why, why make it look like it develops from, you know, the gill slits or the, the slits where the gills would be into one thing in humans and into fish in another? For the same reason that a good engineer uses the same components in a refrigerator, in an automobile, and all kinds of things. And God's the supreme genius. He has certain kinds of designs that work, and he uses them again and again. Well, yeah, two, thing, two, two things there. One, think good reasons. The reason good engineers use the similar parts is because they're available. If a factory is already producing one kind of a part and you can buy that part for it's cheaper than to produce a completely new part. God doesn't have this issue. He can magically poof things into existence. So saying that human engineers use parts from other different machines that do the same function, even when that's true, is not because that's what good engineers do inherently. It's because it's cheaper. God doesn't have a money problem here. So it's not no, that, really apply to God. But, but I wanted I wanted I wanted to go back to your claim that there's no evidence of this. There's tons of evidence of this. The reason we think humans and fish have a common ancestor is the, for example, endogenous retrovirus DNA that we can show when exactly uh, endogenous retroviruses injected their DNA into the DNA stream and see the connecting features in the tree of life to see how they're related. And we can say, oh yeah, hey, look, the endogenous retrovirus that's shared between fish and humans is at this point. And it seems to make sense based on all of the evidence we have that they have a common ancestor, unless it was just random coincidence that endogenous retroviruses injected their DNA into fish and humans at the exact same location in all the different species. Well, the Again. whole assumption of endogenous retroviruses is, is a hypothesis. It's not, there's no actual evidence that these viruses have injected anything. It's, a, it's an idea that has been come up to explain this finding, but the jury's still out on figuring out the details. So that's one idea that come from the evolutionary community. Um, but, um, you know, we, we simply cannot be drawing final conclusions on these things. Wait, well, there's what? a lot more evidence for it than the idea that God made it look like these viruses inserted themselves into the genome at certain points to make it look like it developed over time. That's just, as I said, like you would have to posit that a God basically planted evidence, basically put the evidence there in order to trick us into thinking all of this was somehow evolutionary development rather than design. No, that, that's, again, this is an argument that evolutionists have used for decade after decade, and it's completely bogus. Five-digit extremities right. are a very good example of a design feature that is genius. It's, it's fully functional for many different kinds of creatures. So your explanation that God wouldn't use the same design of five-digit extremities in different kinds of organisms because he doesn't have the problem that engineers have of having to use available materials. It's, it's absurd. It's, it's well, a design feature that works well for many different kinds of creatures. And well, Insects are very successful. They don't have five digits. Of course. Part of, but you see, I hope if that- If it's so people, successful, why not? I hope that people in the audience can see that again and again, you're taking the position that you are in a position to pass judgment upon what you see in the biosphere and determine whether it was well-designed or not. Just like Richard Dawkins foolishly asserts, maybe he's given up, that the eye is badly designed when experts in the eye have pointed out again and again that he's completely wrong and that if the eye were designed the way that he thinks it should be, 
we would have all this blood supply getting in the way of our, our vision, and it would be a terrible design. So what, what, what we need is the humility to recognize that generation after generation of evolution-believing scientists have asserted that the appendix, that the tonsils, that the lanugo, that the wisdom teeth, that the junk DNA didn't have a function here and now in the organism that possessed this particular feature, and they were wrong over and over and over again, while those who believed in God as the supreme being and the designer believed rightly that given enough research and careful investigation, the function and the purpose of these various features and organs would be discovered. Those so were I think the people. You're, yeah, I think you're mischaracterizing. I think you're mischaracterizing the argument here because we're not saying it is bad design. We're saying if it were designed, there would be lots of ways you could design it better. And to some degree, if it were designed, it would be bad design. What we're saying, it is more probable that it developed by a natural process in a, in a sort of bottom-up, systems connecting, systems working with one another, than it is for someone to take a top-down, I'm going to design these things, because if that were the case, there is a lot better ways to design it. And in some cases, vastly better ways to design it. So your mischaracterization of saying it is bad design, that is not our argument. Our argument is it's it's be, it's easier and much, much more likely that these systems developed over time than through design. But look at the example of the tonsils and it refutes what you're saying because by saying that the tonsils were not fully a fully functional part of the immune system, there were already millions of tonsillectomies being performed here in the United States every year. And these were, in most cases, totally unnecessary and stripped away the front line of defense of the immune system of millions of people. Now there have been 30-year-long longitudinal studies proving that if you take two people with the same medical history one has the tonsillectomy, the other one doesn't. After 30 years, the ones that didn't have the tonsillectomy are much healthier than the ones that did. And we're talking about something that was a matter of life and death because during the polio epidemics, doctors observed that people who had had the tonsillectomy were much more likely to end up paralyzed from the polio virus than people who had retained their tonsils because the tonsils were producing specific antibodies against the polio virus. So we're talking about mistakes with life and death consequences on a vast scale where those who held to the traditional Catholic creation framework would never have allowed these terrible abominations to take place. However, you're forgetting that they still do perform to tonsillectomies if the tonsils become infected to a great degree. Um, a large amount of infections, it may actually be advantageous to remove the tonsils rather than to risk continued infection over time. So you've just completely destroyed your own point because that operation is still performed where there is a large amount of infection going on in an individual. Well, yes, however, no, th that's because there's a big difference between prophylactic operations versus operations that are necessary. That's if the it was same well Reason, Sorry, go ahead. But, but that's the same reason why I, as a dentist, don't go in and look in someone's mouth and say, oh, yeah, let's just haul out everybody's wisdom teeth just because it might cause a problem. No, we wait and we see, OK, is it going to is it causing a problem? Is it an issue? If so, OK, let's deal with it. Um, that's not what was happening in the past. You had a large amount of doctors prophylactically removing tonsils in healthy children because they had been taught that these were vestigial organs. Do well, I wanted to, another just, sorry, take jump. You go for it. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on a few things. Like one is the most vestigial limbs are have been proven to be have no function. Essentially, like the little three fingers on an ostrich, it doesn't have a function. Uh, the the like extra thing on the back of the dog's leg that's like halfway up his leg no function yes there are many vestigial limbs that have literally well, no the dew claws is closer to the foot that one does have a function but there is an extra oh. there's lots of different vestigial limbs that don't have a function so saying that one thing is a vestigial limb and being wrong 
10% of the time and being right 90% of the time isn't evidence evolutionists are wrong. They're, they're right 90% of the time. Well, so cherry picking the very few instances they are wrong and ignoring all the cases they're right isn't evidence for your case. Oh. What do you think the function of the three arms on the ostrich is? Well, this is our very, this is our point. We, we don't know the function of every single little thing you can pull out like that, but our position would be that time will tell that these will be proven. Some function will be assigned to these things in most cases. Now, we're also not saying that what you're saying is impossible because it certainly is true that there can be genetic deteriorations in people. De-evolution happens. It is quite possible that something was more useful in the future and it has devolved now. So that certainly could happen. But in general, it, you're far better off saying this might have a function than just coming to the conclusion, no, this is just useless. We, we well, might when you say, um, to, I, I do want to just oh, sorry, we do have limited time for the Q&A and we've yeah, already sure, had sure. Guys about two hours. We want to jump into the Q&A. Folks, sorry, I want to let you know, we're going to get through as many questions as we possibly can. And then we're going to wrap up just because we want to get our guests out of here by a decent time, especially if anybody's on the East Coast. So these questions coming in, every speaker has one minute at most to respond to them. There's no additional context to these questions. So sometimes it's easy to understand. Sometimes you might be wanting more and this is all I have. Sunflower first says, concluding we were created by an intelligent source is as much of an assumption as assuming we weren't created by an intelligent source. We've never witnessed life form spontaneously from non-life. Some of these are in the form of a comment. So we'll give you a chance to respond, each of you, for one minute, as I mentioned. And given that I think it's for you, Dr. Mark and Mr. Colby, we'll let you start. Yeah, you can um, go first, you. Yeah, so, but we have given you evidence that our Lord Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church brings life from non-life every day in every altar where the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the unbloody representation of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross is made present. I, I gave you one example. There have been 153 rigorously examined Eucharistic miracles, and many of them provide that same kind of proof that the bread and the wine that are consecrated by a lawfully ordained priest do turn into the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I don't know, um, I just invite you to, to go back and re-examine that Eucharistic miracle in detail because it does prove that God brought life from non-life in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And the Catholic Church, our Lord Jesus Christ, are the only ones that can do that. Mr. Colby, anything? Okay, so um, the law of abiogenesis, or the law of biogenesis, however you want to state it, is a law of biology that life comes from life, or you can state it in the reverse way, that life doesn't come from non-life. And so this idea that you could have um, things, some inorganic chemicals that could somehow spontaneously assemble themselves into something as complex as what we see in the so-called simplest organisms is insane. I mean, I don't care if you give this a trillion years, you are never going to get spontaneous self-assembly of something into as something as simple as a bacteria. Um, so yeah, that idea, um, non-life from life, um, or sorry, life from non-life, uh, only uh, could ever make sense in terms of someone who is all powerful doing it. You got it, and over to T-Jump or Mark. Yeah, I just want to sort of the law of biogenesis, you've, you've got a bit of a problem there because if life comes only comes from life, then that would make God is alive. But then the law of biogenesis would apply again and life only comes from life. So what life did God come from? You've backed yourself into a total corner with saying, hey, God must be life. And if life produces life, then there must be some other life than God to produce him. Got a bit of a problem there, don't you? Tom? 
Oh, uh, yeah. So all the Yucas miracles have been debunked like many times. There's nothing there. There's no such thing as a law of biogenesis. That's creationist propaganda. Uh, so neither of those things have any basis in any like academic research. You got it. We're going to jump into the next question. Thank you very much for your question. Sunflower <laughs> says, Mark, you're forgetting that, quote, it was aliens theory. If aliens specially <laughs> created humans, that's still special creation. My feathered friend. Yeah, I'm very feathery. Um, yeah, no, thanks, Sunflower. No, I, I do have a sort of a false dichotomy that I refer to that people say, hey, if if evolution is false, then it must have been God that created humans. Or if abiogenesis is false, then it must have been God that created humans. I use it as that's a false dichotomy because if I can provide just one other example of something else, then it's not a true dichotomy at all. So the usual one that I say, hey, it could have been aliens, it could have been a magic space unicorn, it could have been the flying spaghetti monster. There's, they're all disproved this dichotomy of abiogenesis wrong must be God because you're relying on that dichotomy to make your case. Um, so, yeah, I use that as an example. Um, but I would argue against aliens for the same reason that I would argue against God. There is no evidence for it. Um, but if you're saying, hey, the possibility that God is there, well, the possibility that aliens is there as well. You got it. And thank you very much for this question coming in. Oh, sorry. I didn't give everybody a chance. If you no, yeah, yeah, please. Respond, you may. Dr. Mark and Mr. Colby, everybody, uh, everybody gets a chance to respond to each question. So you have a minute each if you'd like. So, uh, first of all, um, it's very important to understand that and I'm directing myself to the audience that um, our friends are not understanding what we're saying about a first cause, because the first cause is that which is its own, has existence, possesses its own existence. It doesn't owe its existence to anything else. And so that first cause, God, can communicate life but doesn't need to receive life from any other being. That's just the common sense answer to what he said. But what we also need to understand is that our friends have said repeatedly, this is debunked and that's debunked. My friends in the audience, these are just assertions on their part. Make your own investigation of the Holy Shroud of Turin. And if you're making an objective examination of all the time. evidence, uh, you will conclude that it is proof that Jesus rose from the dead. Mr. Colby? Um, Francis Crick Colby. actually uh, did come to the conclusion that um, aliens must have seeded life because when he discovered how complex DNA was and he didn't want to believe in God, he did come to the conclusion that some intelligent being had to do it. Now, I think the idea of aliens is ridiculous, but obviously uh, Francis Crick realized how complex DNA was and he had to come to some sort of intelligent design conclusion. So it um, that would be one more step in the right direction, at least compared to believing in uh, spontaneous self-assembly. Gotcha. And I meant to say... Uh... Dr. Mark, not Mr. Uh, Mr. Colby earlier. I got your names flipped as I was. But uh, Tom, did you want to have one last? Uh, did you sure. already get to speak on this one? No. Uh, sure. So I just say that the quantum field is a better necessary self-existing being than a god is because there's actually evidence it exists. And all of the made up Aquinas and Thomistic properties of self-essence and existence just have no basis in reality, whereas quantum fields do. You got it. And thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from... Do appreciate it. Oh, Flamio says, what was Lilith's effect on the genome? They had said that Lilith was created before Eve, straight out of ash or dirt, if I remember. If you would like to respond, Dr. Mark or Mr. Colby. Well, that doesn't come from an authentic Christian source. So I'm sorry, but it's not credible. You have to understand that our Lord Jesus Christ gave very powerful motives of credibility so that we can recognize that he is the unique God-man, the only one that even claimed to forgive sins, and that he would be able to die for our sins and rise from the dead. And so, based on the miracles that he worked in his resurrection, 
he established the Catholic Church and gave her divine teaching authority so that only those books which the Holy Catholic Church identified as the inspired Word of God are credible as divine revelation, and you won't find anything about Lilith in any of those canonical books of the Bible. You got it. And, oh, that's right. Anybody else, would you like to respond? I'll respond. Um, so I'm not sure about uh, any, well, I agree with with you about uh, this, uh, whatever Lilith is having no bearing on anything, but uh, we certainly do believe that Adam and Eve were created perfect genetically, and that explains how um, we got here because genetic deterioration has happened over time. And so after the sin of Adam and Eve, that is when evil and corruption came into the world. And that is the beginning of when human mutations and deterioration happened. And here we are. You got it. And thank you very much for, well, well I suppose Tom and Mark, I don't know if you want to say anything that's more of a Yeah, I'll say something quickly. Just, you know, in fairness, their, their religion doesn't have Lilith. I believe that's a Jewish um, mythology. Uh, I think it was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, but, you know, it doesn't, it, they're not, it's sort of misrepresenting their position because they don't actually believe that Lilith and Adam were the first couple. I nice. presume, you know, I don't want to mis misrepresent you, but. Appreciate your charity. Tom, anything? I'll pass. You got it. Made by Jim Bob says, did evolution predict that humans would be predominantly religious? Yes. It's uh, type one, type two errors. Yes. Anybody else? Well, I don't know if, uh, you know, we, we certainly seem, um, I believe somebody once said we had a, a sort of a religious hole in, in our, our sort of minds where we tend to put gods. I think that sort of talking about evolutionary structures, you can sort of trace the evolution of religion from sort of primitive animism to shamanism to, you know, pantheon, uh, uh, you know, pantheons and then to, to monotheism. It's, it's quite interesting to see the development of it. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, but yeah. It's actually the exact opposite because in as a result of the general belief in microbe to man evolution, this went hand in hand with the idea that religion began with polytheism and animism and evolved into monotheism. But the greatest scholars who looked into this subject, like the great scholar Father Schmidt, totally debunked this. And even evolutionist scholars who've delved into this subject admit now that the original religion of virtually every people group on earth was monotheism. And we've spent much time in Africa. And if you actually spend time and listen to the various uh, people from the various tribes, they will tell you that the original religion was monotheism and monotheism degenerated into polytheism and animism, which is exactly what you would expect from the Bible. But it's also what missionaries, anthropologists, and explorers found as they interacted with indigenous people all over the earth. Got it. Any last thoughts from anyone? I think um, evolution actually does have a hard time explaining any type of spiritual longing in man as it has a hard time explaining um, any of these qualities in life, like beauty, music, love, all of these aspects of life that how, how, why would we have this if we were basically, um, machines that have just sort of arisen with self-preservation in mind? Now, of course, the evolutionists give this spin that, yeah, it's because of, um, trying to keep others alive or whatever. But if you think deeply about this, you will see that the evolutionary idea, especially the atheistic evolutionary idea, doesn't seem to hold water when it comes to these um, deep questions. This one coming in from Oflamio says, what is the difference between a scientific paper and a non-scientific paper? 
one's published in a peer-reviewed academic journal that's vetted by people who are experts in the field and know what they're talking about to know that it's actually valid source of data and one isn't. Anybody else? I'll give the same response, yeah. Okay, I'd like to respond to that because here's something for people in the audience to consider. Here's some scientific research that is published not in a peer-reviewed journal, and now the same research is published in a peer-reviewed journal, but it's the same. Now, is it more true because it's in a peer-reviewed journal than when it's published independently? This is relevant because one of our main research projects within the Kolbe Center has been to collect dinosaur bones and to send them to world-class labs that have an accelerated mass spectrometer that can count the number of carbon-14 and carbon-12 atoms in the sample. And we have shown, we have proven beyond any doubt that all the dinosaur bones contain substantial amounts of carbon-14, which cannot be reasonably attributed to contamination, which proves that the dinosaurs lived thousands of years ago, did not become extinct 65 million years ago. Now, here's the interesting thing. We have papers on our website that contain the data that were not published in peer-reviewed journals. But we have presented the data in world-class scientific conferences where they were subjected to peer review before they were allowed to be presented. And you know what we found? We had to fight intense censorship, not because there was anything wrong with the data, but because the fact that virtually everything in the geological column that still retains organic material and contains carbon-14 totally refutes I'm, the evolutionary paradigm. Anybody um, else? Yeah, I'll just say, um, I mean, I agree with you and that, um, yes, it's true. Oftentimes something being peer reviewed um, can be beneficial, at least in theory. However, it also uh, leaves open um, the concept of the tyranny of the majority. If the majority of people peer reviewing have a bone to pick with some aspect of this, whether it be um, a metaphysical implication or any other thing, maybe they just don't like the guy, it won't get published. And so, um, again, you can have perfectly valid scientific papers that have been thrown in the garbage uh, because of this. So we can't conflate being scientific with being peer-reviewed, even though it does certainly have its place. I think peer-reviewed is blind. Your name isn't do. on it. They don't, they don't know who published it. Uh, well, let's these see. scientific circles are smaller than you think, though. This one yeah, and peer review doesn't I hate to do it, but just because everybody's already spoken for their minute, I hate to do it, but just because yeah, otherwise sorry. I'm going to get grilled by people for not getting to their questions. Bubblegum Gun says... Or in this case, a statement. He uh, he's coming after you, Tom and Mark. He says vestigial organs is the atheist retrofitting of the data. No, it's not. It's using other evidence of other vestigial limbs, which have been accurately identified as vestigial limbs, and oh, this is kind of similar to these things. Can we be wrong? Sure. Is the fact that some people in evolution are wrong about some things evidence evidence against evolution? No. Because creationists are wrong more than evolutionists about most things. Anybody else? Yeah, and vestigial organs, as I pointed out earlier, they have gone to court about, you know, what can constitute a vestigial organ, irreducible complexity. Kids metal look versus over, look it up. Um, yeah, and and, and I, I, I mean, you can make that statement. It's got no basis in science whatsoever. Um, just because some people use vestigial wrong um, in colloquial terms doesn't invalidate science at all any more than, you know, a person using something wrong in biology invalidates medicine. Um, yeah, it's just a nonsense statement. Well, I, I would just like to, again, direct my comment to the audience. I mean, just think about it. Can it really be true in light of everything that you've heard that the creation framework was not more conducive to fruitful scientific and medical research when we've given many powerful examples of how this belief in microbe demand evolution led to the an inability to properly investigate the appendix, the tonsils, the junk DNA, the lanugo, 
and embryonic development. Uh, you, you look into it and decide for yourself. I, I think you're going to come down agreeing with us and, and not with our friends. Uh, and I'll just say, um, yeah, I think people should look more into this topic of vestigial organs because this was really hammered home by the evolutionists that there were all these vestigial things and it's just coming to light more and more and more that these are debunked. So, yeah, I think people should research this topic more themselves. I think that's it for our Q&A. I want to remind you folks, our guests are linked in the description. You can learn more about their views by clicking on those links below. And that includes if you're listening via the Modern Day Debate podcast, as each of these debates, such as this one, is uploaded within 24 hours to the Modern Day Debate podcast, available on fine podcast apps everywhere. So I want to say thank you very much, Tom, Mark, Dr. Mark, and Mr. Colby. It's been a true pleasure to have you guys on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. So folks, stick around. We'll be back with a post credit scene in just a moment, letting you know about upcoming debates. And one last thank you to our guests. Dear friends, I want to say thanks so much for your support. Thrilled to have you here. And I want to say, I get a chance to say hello to you in the old chat. Nano, glad to have you here. Know your realm. I see you there in the old live chat. Glad you were with us. And Absolute Death, glad you are here. As well as Zaldrizo, glad you're here. As well as Dimples, happy to have you with us. Master Optics, glad you're here. Radio Flyer, pumped to have you here. Colorado Biker, Thanks for being with us. And then Tyler Siriani, thanks for being here. And Zanju, glad you're here. Not Sid, pumped to have you with us. As well as Heat Shield, pumped you are with us. As well as Woody Woodpecker, good to see you there. And Spirit Toby, pumped to have you. Straight Serum, good to see you back. Gross Patat, good to have you back. Radio Flyer, glad you're here. Manic Pandas, happy to have you with us. Trigger warning, pumped you're with us. Glad to have you there. And then made by Jim Bob. Good to see you again. Jungle Jargon. Good to see you. Want to say, my dear friends, Coffee Troll says, hey, James. Hey, Coffee Troll. Hope you're doing well. And we have got to tell you a couple of things. One, in particular, we are thankful for our guests. So we always do want to encourage people to attack the arguments instead of the guests. And you guys do a great job of that. So we are thankful for that. As well as we want to say, hey, great job. And your guys' support of this channel. Seriously, we're excited about the future of Modern Day Debate. And you guys really do. I've, like, I've got to thank you because, seriously, you have no idea how much you help make this channel possible. Here are some ways. One, hey, it's a small thing, but it does help us in the YouTube algorithm. In other words, YouTube recommends our videos more. If you hit that like button, we're only three likes away from 150. So, highly encourage you. If you hit that like, that helps. Thank you for always doing that. That really does help the channel. And we know that you're with us in terms of pursuing the vision of providing a neutral platform so that everybody can make their case on a level playing field, no matter what walk of life they are from. And so made by Jim Bob, thanks for your super chat. So sorry. I, we just wrapped up so quick that I don't know if you saw you you might be behind us in the stream uh, that the speakers have been gone for about maybe 45 seconds. And so, so I'm sorry that last super chat, we're not able to read during the Q and a, but we do do appreciate your support and want to say my dear friends, 
there are other ways you help. So that's another example. When you guys submit questions for the Q&A, that helps a ton. Seriously. It really does. If we didn't have questions from you guys, it, there wouldn't be a Q&A. You need an audience with questions to have a Q&A for crying out loud. So that's another way you help the channel. Trinity Matrix, glad to see you here as well as Oflamio. And Dimple says, thanks for the chat. It's nice to hear from other perspectives. Thanks, Dimples. And I love that this chat is an eclectic mix of different people from different walks of life. We have Christian people here, Muslim people here, Black Hebrew Israelite, atheist, agnostic, you name it, whatever you want to call yourself. We know that you're here and we appreciate you guys being here as this is. It's no doubt about it. And I appreciate somebody just said that in a different chat. They said, hey, I like that modern day debate is not an echo chamber. It's got like a mix of different ideas. And so, hey, it's absolutely, I think it really does. And we appreciate you guys being here, being a part of that eclectic mix as you bring different views and ideas. We appreciate that. And Spirit Toby says, I'm so glad James does an excellent job of taking care of all of his guests. More discussion. Thank you for that, Spirit Toby. And we're looking for ways that we can take care of our guests. What we do is first, we always link our guests. Debate channels that don't link their guests, I think, honestly, I just, I don't really respect that. And here's the reason. They, the guests, are coming on and it helps produce the content, obviously, because if you don't have debaters, you don't have a debate. And, and so when I see some channels that are like, well, we're not going to link them, though. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. YouTube deserves a better class of debate channel, and we're going to give it to them. Here's another way in which we try to help our guests. We always try to give them a MP4 copy of the debate. Sometimes they have to remind me because sometimes I forget, but it's something that we are happy to send. If they send me a reminder, I'm always happy to send them an MP4 copy of the debate so they can upload it on their own channel. It's their content, right? It is. They're the debaters. And the one good reason, glad to see you there in the old chat, as well as Master Optics and Renee Hamilton. Glad to have you with us. Manic Panda says, hey, James, glad to see you. As well as Mango T, thanks for your super chat, says, am I debating Impostate Prophet on Thursday? What? Well, that's something I've got to confirm with him yet. So let me, I, I can't remember if you responded to my email. So let me first ask him. It might be further out, Mango T. Bear with me. And I'll, I'll get back to you on that. But yes, it looks like he's plausibly interested in a debate with you on whether or not Islam is the one true religion. So that should be a juicy, controversial debate. Radio Flyer, glad to have you here. Uh, says legit good channel thanks for that radio flyer seriously we really appreciate it i always want you guys to know too we are open to feedback so for real feel free in the chat or email me you guys you know i'm at modern day debate at gmail.com so it's our name the name of the channel at gmail that's a pretty easy email remember if you want to give me feedback you can and i'm open-minded for real I will admit there are ways that we can improve this channel. And so that's something I want you to feel comfortable being able to do that. Uh, as if you're kind of like, yeah, sometimes I think the chat is a little bit too restrictive. You know, sometimes we can't insult the speakers and, you know, you know, and I get that there's a difference between harassing a speaker, like you're, you're trying to make them feel bad versus like friendly teasing. Like if you say like James is a beta or a soy boy, like I'm not bothered by that. And I know that you're not ill intentioned. And likewise, if you guys call the like speakers, like a soy boy, <laughs> Brenton, <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> but seriously. Okay. So <laughs> I love Brenton. I'm teasing, but we really do. He, he's a friend of the channel. Brenton has helped us a ton. So <clears throat> And he said, he always tells me, he says, James, I don't eat soy protein. I, he appreciates pea, like the vegetable peas. He, he has pea protein. But I want to say, let me tell you this. This channel, we are thankful for your support. You guys have made it awesome. A number of ways that help us and that you guys, because I, I can see in the creator studio, like in the YouTube, a lot of you guys, well, some of you know, because some of you guys do your own channel. And I can tell you as YouTubers, like YouTube does a pretty good job of showing us stats in the background. I'm always looking at our stats like crazy because I think that people vote with their feet. And so when people show up for debates and we see like, wow, look, that debate not only had a ton of views, but the retention time, because all stats in YouTube tend to positively correlate. So like if one video gets a lot of likes, not surprisingly, it also has a lot of views like they're and they're pretty closely correlated too, by the way. So it's not like a correlation of like 0.1 because that's not very meaningful. It's the correlations are sometimes pretty strong. The point is, I see that you guys share these videos a lot and that helps. If you want, you can click the share button below because you probably enjoyed this debate, right? I mean, you're here, right? You're still here. In that, in that sense, think about this. 
you can always click the share button down below. See, just down here, you can click it and you can share the link with somebody through Facebook Messenger. If you have a buddy on there that you talk to about debates or Twitter DMs or maybe even Instagram. Do you guys talk to friends on Instagram about like debates? I don't know. Or these like topics like religion and atheism and science. I don't know. But it could be. So for me, I got to be honest, when I share YouTube videos, which I actually do it often, I would say it's almost daily. Like it's pretty common that I'll see. It's usually when I see something that's funny because I love listening to debates, but I do that like, I don't know, five times a week. So when I'm not hosting, I'm actually, I'm not, I'm usually not listening to debates. Sometimes I am, but I'm actually usually listening to prank phone call channels. No, <laughs> for real. And if it's really good, if there's a really good prank phone call, like is Diesel or Unlimited? That's how Diesel, if you ever see him in the chat, that's how we met. Is if there's a really good prank phone call, I will share it with a friend and I will link it. So I think I even sent one just this morning. I sent one to Diesel. Uh, but anyway, I share it on my Twitter DMs, Facebook Messenger, because I'm a boomer. And so I oftentimes will share, you know, I talk on Facebook. And I know the Zoomers, the young folk, I don't know what you, you guys use TikTok. Does TikTok have DMs? I think it does. But wherever you want to share footage of debates or I should say videos, you can. And that helps us because good old fashioned word of mouth. I'm serious. You guys, you guys have heard this a billion times. You're like, please, James, no. Good old fashioned word of mouth is seriously a big deal. Because if I go on Twitter and I say, hey, you guys, this debate is awesome. And I'm using like the Twitter, uh, let's say I'm the modern day debate Twitter account because that's all I have. And I say, oh, yeah, like. Does T jump message me? My brother. Oh. But <laughs> it's like basically <clears throat> I'll respond later. The point is this. I think I was saying this. Okay, I forgot. I think it was something about sharing, and I said, yeah, like, oh yeah, yeah. Is that I've told you this a thousand times. If I share on Twitter with the modern day debate Twitter account. I say, hey, this debate is awesome. You got to check it out. People will be like, yeah, it's a modern day debate. You know, it's like you're self-promoting. This is sad. But if you share a debate and you say, hey, you know, I really, you know, hi, Barbara. Hi, Alan. I loved this debate. That is third party credibility. Like you're kind of a non-biased, like I'm, I didn't, I'm admittedly biased. I promote modern day debate all the time, like in our tweets or whatever it is. And thank you very much for, let's see. I just like reading your chats. Clinton Rosh says, I only come here for the beard and hearing my last name butchered by a smarty pants. I'm good. F it's in good fun, James. Peace be with, you. be with you. Thank you, Clinton. And yeah, want to say, though, it is totally cool. Jer Jeremy Nolan, good to see you there. As well as Zaldrizo says, Modern Day Debate and James are amazing. We all agree. Well, everyone but Darth Karen. Thank you for your support. Seriously. That's right. Darth won't come back. I can't help it. We'll get him back. I'll get Converse to host it, and then he'll come back, I think. But I want to say thank you guys for your support. Seriously. Dave Hill, good to see you there in the old live chat. Heat Shield, long time friend of the channel. And that's the thing, too. You know, like, you guys, I do appreciate. You guys have been so supportive of me personally. You guys know that I've gone through uh, you know, a lot lately. I don't want to get into it. But I just want to say thank you guys. I don't want to, I don't want to sound so dismissive of it. It's just that it's a heavy topic. So I don't. Um, but long story short, I want to. So it's like hard, but I want to say thank you guys for your support of me personally. Thank you for the support of the channel. Thank you guys for your support of the moderators that have stepped in when I was unable to host. So when I'm in my hometown, it's always been the case. And it also was the case this spring that it's difficult for me to host because there's not a lot of internet connection in my hometown that I can find where I can host. And so I'm grateful that the guest mods had done a fantastic job. People like Kaz, Converse Contender, Carissa, Amy, trying to think is there anybody else i'm forgetting we might have rose wrist as a host sometimes for real you know do you know rose wrist but thank you for your support renee hamilton says these debate these debates are dripping with juice they are juicy to say the least you guys i it's honestly so fun to do this and yes i do love juicy brooke sparrow says i appreciate that's the hundred percent. That's right. We've got these emojis. And I know that I think what we're going to do as I, I'm going to let you guys know this, because I think some people were turned off and I didn't mean to it. 
I turned on the members only chat today and some people I think were turned off. Um, I think most weren't, to be honest. I think most people are like, nah, it's a few minutes. They do it like every other month or something. Nah. And a lot of you guys, the reason is like for real, a lot of people don't know that we do have memberships. We do. And, and now if you were here in today's chat, you for sure know. But the reason that I say that is not all channels do. For real, like a channel has to turn on the memberships in order to have them. So we had already, we had 50,000 subscribers before we ever turned it on. And we could have turned it on way before that. I think it's at like 10,000. I can't remember. But anyway, I don't think we're going to do that as a perk anymore because I don't want it to, because some people, like I said, are turned off by that. And I, and I know most people are not turned off by that. And I appreciate that. Like I said, it's only a few minutes every few months or something. We haven't done it for like six months. But... It is something that we want you to know. We do have channel memberships, something to consider. And also, I'm amazed that a lot of times when I put these polls up, when I ask, did you know if we had a podcast? Modern Day Debate is not just a YouTube channel. It's a podcast. And I think every time the plurality, namely the largest group, so it's not necessarily a majority, but it's, you know, sometimes it's like 37%, but it's the biggest group has not heard about the Modern Day Debate podcast. And so that's something I want to I wanna plug as well. And uh, I have to let you know, it's on fine podcast apps everywhere. iTunes, Apple Podcasts, what's that green one? Spotify, Podcast Addict, Google Podcasts, everything. We really are on every podcast. I've worked really hard. We're, we're still getting on PodBod. That's one that I still have not gotten on. But it's only got like two people uh, that use that app. So, but Mrs. New eighty six, thanks for being with us. And then let's see, Dimples debating in the chat. I appreciate your gusto, Dimples. Brooks Sparrow says, please give a shout out to Let's Farm Cat Patches, who passed away today. I'm really sorry to hear that, Let's Farm. Seriously, that is a bummer. I know that is really painful as I. Like, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry to hear that let's farm and we hope you're, you're doing all right. We're glad that you were here. Let's farm. We love you. You're a part of the family. Thanks for all you've done in discord and we just appreciate you. And I've just always been thankful for you. And, uh, thanks for always dealing with me is sometimes I know that I'm like, I sometimes, uh, <clears throat> I admit I get a little bit burnt out sometimes and I'm probably, sometimes I probably seem a little bit like irritable or something. And it's, I run myself into the ground on accident. Cause sometimes like I, and I've been doing it the last couple of days, I've just been going so just doing so much to where I'm like, okay, I, this isn't even healthy. It's just that I'm always trying to be busy and like emailing. I've been emailing so many new people today alone. It was exhausting emailing so many people that we've never had on before big, big name people. So for example, like Mark Dice and who was the other one that Gad sad we've, so I've been reaching out. Those are just a couple examples of people we've been reaching out to. Uh, one we've uh, reached out to and yeah, we, who I won't mention because it will trigger so many people, but Dave Hill says digging the Zangief junior look, by the way, thank you for that. I don't know who that is, but I appreciate that. And yes, I really do. I'm excited about this beard. I like it. It feels tremendous. It's like, an, you know, for, for men, a beard is like an ornament of the face. And, you know, I don't say, I don't recommend it to all men, but I recommend it to me. I like it. And I want to say, though, is there anything I'm forgetting that I usually talk about? In terms of the vision of the channel, you guys all know what this is. We are a nonpartisan channel. So, in other words, I never put out any videos because here's the thing. There's, like, in terms of, like, the minimal level of neutrality when it comes to debates is you have a neutral moderator. You have to have that. Some channels don't even have that, for crying out loud. But I'll admit a lot of channels actually have that. So, for example, like, I think Dylan Burns is a fair host or moderator. However, and I'm not knocking this because I know that most channels, it's just not their style, and that's fine. Like, I, I totally get it, is that... To be even more neutral in hosting debates, like we don't even put out any content that's like just, you know, me, James saying, hey, guys, I really think this is the case. And it's just going to be a video of me making my case. We don't even do that. It is fully neutral around here. And like I said, I don't fault any channels for doing that. It's just not what we do. It's part of our brand that we really are 
legit neutral. So if we host it, if we put a video up, it's going to be a debate, and that's the only kind of video that we put up. Perfect one says you can listen to modern day debate while you run your errands. That's true. Yeah, I mean save your data too because if you're wanting, you're like oh, I want to listen to modern day debate. Is it's a piece of cake. You can listen. You can download it right there at your house or your workplace, wherever you've got a good Wi-Fi connection, download it there. You can listen to it while you're commuting, while you're exercising, whatever it is. Yeah, Heat Shield says, James, I found a fault in Spotify podcast that leaks account owner email address. I haven't made it public yet because they're fixing it now. Just beware of strange emails for the next few days. That's good to know. I'm trying to think. I don't think I've had any yet, but I'll keep an eye for it. And I appreciate you letting me know. That's pretty interesting. And yeah, I've got to tell you, in terms of upcoming debates, as you know, Christian versus Muslim, whether or not there is scientific evidence for whether or not Muhammad is the one true prophet that's coming up this Saturday, we've also got some based and or red-pilled debates coming up. In particular, we're going to have a good old flat earth one this Friday. I might have to take Friday off. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to host that one. I'm pretty pooped. Today, I like I said, I ran myself into the ground where I'm like, okay, it's not even healthy. It's... it's uh. But I'm Dory. I'm going to get some rest tonight. I'm going to get a lot of sleep. Zaldrizo says, James, you must be up on your old Valerian because you said my name like a champ. Zaldrizo. Valerian. I didn't know that was a language. Is that a language? I thought, so I take Valerian root to help help me like sleep well. But I didn't know it was a language. Gross Patat says, that's why I love Modern Day Debate. Appreciate your support. Appreciate that. And... Heat Shield says, Dice, that's pushing it to the next level. I know. I don't know if we're going to get him. Hunter Avalon wants a debate with him. So I asked him, and hopefully we hear back. To be honest, I don't – I've emailed him once before. I don't think we're going to hear back. But, hey, it's worth a shot. Heat Shield says, James, I found – oh, okay, we got that one. Dave Hill says, it's Street Fighter. That much of a dated reference now? Oh, man. Yeah, I don't. I know a lot of Mortal Kombat, or not a lot. The new games, like I fell off. I fell off the wagon after Mortal Kombat Four, but I know a decent amount of Mortal Kombat, way more than Street Fighter. But let's see. Love, oh, I think I remember what he looks like now. Let me Google this really quick. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. You know, like, that's a cool look. Yeah, you know. Okay, I'll take what I can get. I mean. Oh, he's, that guy's pretty big. But yeah, I mean, he does have a cool look. I like it. Uh, yeah, I like this look. It's fun. I mean, I don't have a mohawk. But anyway. Yeah, he's got a based beard. Good for him. Now, I want to say I love you guys. Thanks for your support. I should go because I, I love doing this. I honestly would love to just stay and do this forever. But uh, I should go. I, I got to get some sleep and uh, catch up on a lot of stuff. So. Andres Castano says, hey, James, do you get paid for this or is it a hobby? Thank you. So it, the channel is monetized and it is like a fun like way of like, yeah, just, you know, like money comes in through like ad revenue or super chats. It's not to the point of where I could like live and, you know, do this full time. So I plan on finishing my Ph.D. I'm in my fourth year. Just finished my fourth year. Whoa. Um, is I'm finishing my fourth finish my fourth year in the Ph.D. And I've got a year or two left. And then I don't think it would be enough. Like, I don't think the channel would be big enough to go full time with it. Uh, sometimes they say that like 70, like I had heard one person. Well, one person I know went full time when they made 75,000 subscribers. But it all depends on a lot of different factors. So like uh, these things are correlated in terms of like how much revenue a channel has come in in their subscriber number. But at the same time, they're not correlated like on a, it's not like a point a 1.0 correlation. It's so I, it's, I think it's going to be a while before I would able to do be able to do this full time, but I would love to. Oh, man, like I love modern day. Debate. It's, it's so fun. And so my hope is to keep on growing modern day debate. And then maybe in, at least I, like I don't think there's any chance I could go full time with it for at least another two years. And then maybe in two between two and five years. Hopefully it'd be I'd love to go full time with it. I don't like I said, who knows the future, but. Let's see. H. L. Aristoteles says, be well all. And that's a great way to end. I want to say thank you guys for your support. I love you guys. Thanks for all of your help with the channel. Seriously. We're at 165 likes. Only five more will be at 170. So we can totally hit that goal. But want to say thanks, guys. I love you. 
I look forward to seeing you as we continue to passionately fulfill the vision of providing a neutral platform so that everybody can make their case on a level playing field. That's important to us, and that's what we're doing here. So thank you guys for your support. It really does mean a lot. And so hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the, the unreasonable, and I'll see you next time.